dear students in physics in the section electricity let's see another experiment right the title of this experiment is determination of an unknown resistance using meter bridge so this is the first time we are going to use meter bridge in this uh, in in our experiments so let me first explain before we go and see the meter bridge let me explain it to you how meter bridge works and how we use that in a circuit. Let me show it to you. Meter bridge has a string. One meter length string is there. And this string is connected. How? The string is connected on a board like this. Right. There is a point here. There is a point here. Right. This is how the meter bridge will look like. This is a string which has uniform cross section. So you know, you know, R equals to the resistance R equals to rho L over A. Rho is a constant. Resistivity is a constant. For a particular material, it's a constant. Along this string, if the cross section doesn't change, A is also constant. If rho is constant, A is constant, then we can say rho R is proportionate to L. Right? In proportion to L, R will increase. That means Every centimeter of this string will have same equal resistance because A is same, cross section is same, rho is same, right? Such a string it is. These are metallic strips, wide metallic strips. Why do we use wide metallic strips? As it has been even tested in the exam questions because the resistance of these strips must be negligible. We don't consider the resistance of those connecting strips. So by increasing the cross section, when A increases, you can see R will reduce, right? Therefore, we are using wide metallic strips, wide copper strips to reduce the resistance such that the resistance of these connecting uh, rods need not be considered, connecting strips need not be considered in the calculations, right? Now what do we do? Look at this. We can connect a, see the additional connections, let me draw in a different color. In between these two, we will connect a resistance R, right? In between these two, let's connect that unknown resistance x that we want to find unknown resistance still nowhere power has been given let me give the power supply right we'll have a switch right let it be like this Now let's let's take some numbers. Let's say let's say this battery's electromotive force is two voltage, and the R is zero. Internal resistance is negligible. Let's assume. Right, when the circuit is closed, this two volt has to be the two volt because connecting wires. You can assume they are. Resistance is negligible, so there won't be any, any voltage drop in the connecting wires. So across this red color wire also, because you can see this battery, this string are parallel, parallel, which means the string also should have two voltage drop across the string. If I assume this point voltage is zero, this point also zero, 
this point also zero voltage. If this is zero, internal resistance is not there. On the other side, this has to be two voltage point. Why? EMV, electromotive force is two voltage. If this is two voltage, this point also two voltage because it's just the connecting wire. So zero volt, two volt, can you see across this wire, across this string, there is a two voltage drop. And this two voltage will uniformly reduce here. If you take the midpoint, 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 where 50 centimeter on side, 50 centimeter on side. Let's say I'm, I'm measuring from here, zero, 50 centimeter, 100 centimeter. Then this point will have one voltage. Why? Zero, two voltage, it uniformly changes. If you take 25 centimeter point here, that will have half of this 0.5 voltage. If you take 75 centimeter here, that will have one, oh, this has to be 1.5 voltage. Hmm. One, zero, so 0.5 voltage. How do we know it uniformly reduces? Because R is proportionate to L. So every centimeter the resistance is same, therefore the voltage drop has to be same. V equals IR, same current goes through. So every centimeter, if you break it into 100, one centimeter segments, each of them have same resistance. So IR, the voltage drop across them is IR, that IR value will be same for each centimeter. Clear? Right. Now, Similarly, if you look at these two points, this is two voltage because it's just the connecting strip. This is also zero voltage. That means in between these two points, two voltage drop is there. Let's say this R is 10 volt, 10 ohms. R is 10 ohm. Let's say this unknown resistance, we are yet to find that. Let's say it is 8 ohms. Huh? 8 ohms. Then what will happen, this two voltage has to drop proportionately among these two resistance, 10 ohm, 8 ohm. So, how much has to be in between this, this resistance, can I say this way, two voltage into, this is 8 ohm, 8 over 18, why 18, 10 plus 8, how much is that? Huh? 4 over 9, 8 by 9. 8 by 9 is 0.89 voltage. 0.89 voltage. So across this resistance, 0.89 voltage has to be there. If this is 0, this point has to be 0.89 voltage. And this is 0.89, here it is 2 voltage. So across this one, you have 2.89 difference, 1.11 voltage drop. Shall we double check how that comes? Same calculation, 2 into, this is 10 ohm, 2 voltage falls across both, 10 and 8. Hmm. 20 by 18, that is 10 by 9, which is 1.11 voltage. Double check, 2.89, difference is 1.11 voltage. This is how the meter bridge is going to be. Now look at the interesting part. This point is 0.89 voltage. Look at the string. On this side it is 0 voltage. On this side it is 2 voltage. So when you move along this line, at some point this also has to have 0.89 voltage, isn't it? Where would it be? 0.5, 1, 0.75, somewhere here, let's say. This point is going to be 0.89 voltage. Correct. Now, now, look at the interesting part. We will take a galvanometer, center zero galvanometer, center zero galvanometer means galvanometer measures current. But usually ammeter measures current only in one direction, look at this. If it is an ammeter plus minus, let's say there is a resistance and all. The battery is plus and ammeters plus must be connected together. Battery is minus must be connected to ammeters minus. Then ammeter will show you how much of current 
flows through this. Suppose if I have connected like this, ammeter plus minus right. If I have connected like this, this wouldn't show us any reading. This wouldn't show us any reading. Because ammeter through ammeter, the current can go in only in one direction. It gets the readings only in one direction. The other direction current can flow, but it wouldn't show any readings. So now if you look at this first one, the current flows like this plus to minus current flows. So it will show a reading. But now the current flows minus to plus by batteries plus is here, right? So for the battery from batteries plus to batteries minus current flow is going to be there. I is going to be there. But ammeter has been fixed in a wrong manner plus minus has gone wrong. Therefore, this wouldn't show you any reading. So that's the normal ammeter. Ammeter shows reading only in one direction. If you want a meter that shows the current both ways, then we have galvanometer, center zero galvanometer. If you look at the dial, if, if you take ammeter dial, ammeter dial, ammeter or millimeter dial, you will have zero here say 1 ampere here. This is how it increases 0 to 1 ampere, 0 to 5 ampere, 0 to 10 ampere. It starts from 0 and goes. That's ammeter. If you take, if you take a galvanometer, 0 is going to be in the center. On this side you have readings, let's say 1. On the other side also you will have readings. 1 or 2 or 5 or whatever. So if current goes from one direction to other, one for say plus to minus, let's say if, if, I, if I mark the endings as, let's say, okay, A, B. If current goes in this direction, it might show readings in one way, okay, here, one direction on this side. If current flows the other direction, B to A if the current flows, it shows the readings on the other side of it. That's what we call center zero galvanometer. Then we say high sensitive galvanometer. High sensitive galvanometer means even if there is a micro ampere current, it shows you. It shows a turning, it, sh it shows a reading even if there is current at micro ampere levels. That's what we call center zero or high sensitive center zero galvanometer. High sensitive center zero galvanometer. Such a galvanometer, I am going to fix here. How? Look at this. Connect one side of it here. And the other side of it, there will be a sliding contact, sliding key, which won't be fixed anywhere, which is like a pencil, but it's, it, it conducts current. I can hold it and, you know, touch it at different, different points. So take that sliding sliding contact and connect it at this point first. Then take that sliding contact, connect it here to. Then take that sliding contact, touch it here three. Let's see what happens. This is 0.5 volt. So point number one. The voltage here is going to be less than 0.5. Galvanometer's other side is connected to 0 0.89. 0 0.89, it's like 0 0.4 voltage. The current flow will be from this point to this point. Let's say if I call this as point A, point B, A to B current flows. Or shall I say from top to bottom current flows. That is in first case. So in the first case, let's say galvanometer shows a reading like this. Right. Then you bring it to the second case. Look at this one. Here the voltage is more than 1. 1.3, 1.4 voltage. Here it is 0.89. Right, you have connected one point here and the other point you have connected here. Second case, huh? the same sliding contact. First case I kept it here. Second case I am going to keep it here. Third case I am going to keep it here. So second case when I am keeping it here, the voltage at this point is going to be approximately 1.3 voltage. Here it is 0.89 voltage. Current will go from bottom to top. From the bottom to up, the current flow is going to be there. Earlier, it was from the top to bottom, right? For the top to bottom, if the readings have turned to right side, 
when the current side changes direction changes it will show other side read right this is, it will show other side read this is why we need a center zero galvanometer it can reduce the readings both sides then you come to point 3 point 0.89 voltage point 0.89 voltage what will happen what will happen both are equipotential points the potentials are same at both points there will not be a current flow there will not be a current flow clear then it will show zero reading it will show zero reading right okay so if it is 0.89 voltage how much length would it be let's look at this for 100 centimeters to voltage right 100 centimeter 2 voltage for 8.89 voltage 0.89 voltage this distance has to be huh this distance has to be 44.5 centimeter and other side distance has to be 100 minus 44.5 right 55.5 how did i get that look at this 2 voltage for 400 centimeter now you are talking about 0.89 that is 44.5 centimeter so this equilibrium equilibrium means where the galvanometer shows zero reading will happen at 44.5 centimeter clear right now i assume this value i thought okay i knew this value and i, I have done all these calculations let's say now you didn't know the values you you knew this 10 ohm you didn't know this 8 ohm if so, how do we find it? Still, the equilibrium point has to be same, right? 8 ohm is 8 ohm. Only thing I don't know it is 8 ohm, right? So, what do you do? What do you do? If you find the equilibrium point, I can write a formula like this. Look at this. R and X ratio, uh, X over R ratio will be equal to this side length. Let it be L1 or L. L over 100 minus L. Why? The ratio between these two resistance will decide how much voltage is going to drop in each of them. Similarly, the ratio between the resistance of these two parts of the string, this is where the equilibrium is. So, equilibrium, it's left side, it's right side. You can consider them as two different resistances. The ratio between those two resistances, but ratio between those two resistances means ratio between the length because r is proportionate to l so if you take the ratio between these two lengths of the strings and if you take the ratio between these two resistors that has to be same at the equilibrium point at the equilibrium point not not at any point when g e shows zero reading that means once you have figured out once you have figured out this and this are having same potential then you can say the potential drop in r potential drop in this wire are equal that's why you have equipotential the potential drop in x the voltage drop in x the voltage drop in this part of the string are equal because this side is zero if this side is equal if this point is equipotential if galvanometer doesn't show any reading then those two must have same same potential drop voltage drop Therefore, we can write a formula, the ratio between R and X should be equal to ratio between these two lengths, right? So, where am I? X over R equals L over 100 minus L. In this, R is known. L, we can read from this table. L is known. We can find X. R is known. L is known. We can find X. With one reading itself, we can find X. But there can be always errors. So what we do, we go for a graphical method. What do we do? We, we put a resistor box here. We put a resistor box here so that we can change the resistances. So use different R's and then find the L, different L values. We can go for a graph as well. Right? How would you go for a graph? The graph will be we can say uh, if you write it upside down, right, R over X equals 100 over L minus L over L is 1. Uh, we are changing R only. So, take it to the other side. 
that means 100 ol or we will keep 1 ol then the 100 comes down 1 over 100 x into r minus 1 over 100 y m x c with a negative gradient you get a with a, with a positive gradient and negative intercept you get a graph if you find the gradient of the graph that will give you 1 over 100 x here the uh, readings of l has to be in centimeters that's why i have written 100 minus l sometimes they give it in meters meters then what you do this won't be 100 minus l this will be 1 minus l now write it upside down 1 over L minus 1 because 1 minus L over L that is 1 over L minus 1. 1 over L equals 1 over X into R plus 1. Oh wait, 1 over X into R this has to be plus 1 here not, not minus intercept. It has to be plus intercept. Minus 1 comes to the other side plus 1 yeah. So here also plus 1. one over, uh, Y equals MX plus C. Clear. So, 1 over L is going to be in the y axis because that is a dependent variable and what we are changing ourselves is R. R, R is the independent variable. Draw the graph, getting 5 or 6, 4 or 5 readings would be enough, 5 readings would be more than enough. Get 5 readings, draw the graph. If you are getting the readings in centimeters, gradient of the graph is going to be 1 over 100x. If you are getting the readings in meters, the gradient of the graph is going to be 1 over x. From this we can find x, x is the unknown resistance. Clear? Right. So, this is what we say using the meter bridge to find the unknown resistance. There is one more thing about using galvanometer. Try to understand this. When you use galvanometer, let us say you have connected this point somewhere and this point is a sliding contact which you are going to keep at different different points of the string and find out where the equilibrium is. So, what we usually do, we do not connect galvanometer like this. Because suppose if you connect it at, if you, if you touch this at points where the potential difference between this point and this point is very high, then a high current would flow through galvanometer. This is a high sensitive galvanometer. Through the high sensitive galvanometer, you should not allow high current to flow. For example, high current means this is a galvanometer which, which measures current in microampere. So, for a microampere uh, a galvanometer, let us say its maximum reading is 5 microampere. 5 microampere is the maximum reading. Right. Let us say you have connected between this point and this point has a difference of 1 voltage and let us say the galvanometer's resistance is very negligible right because ammeter itself we assume the resistance to be negligible. So, imagine you are using a galvanometer with let us say 0.1 ohm, 0.1 ohm resistance or oh, 1 ohm let us say forget about 1 ohm let us say 10 ohm fine 10 ohm resistance then the current is going to be 0 0.1, 0 0.1 ampere, 0 0.1 ampere, 0.1 ampere means 100 milliampere, 100 milliampere means 100,000 microampere. So, it is a galvanometer which has a maximum scale of 5 microampere, but you are sending a current of 100,000 microampere. 20,000 bigger current goes through that, 20,000 bigger current goes through that, right. So, it is very high, we do not realize it's very high current does not mean it has to be 230 voltage that goes through or 11,000 voltage that goes through these high power uh, lines. No, for this micro uh, the, for this galvanometer which can measure in microamperes, even 0 0.1 ampere is considered to be very high. 20,000 times of its maximum scale, right. Therefore, we need to protect it. How do we protect it? How do we protect it? Look at this. Look at this here. Nicely, we go and put a 
weak resistance here. Let's say a uh, 5 kilo ohm resistance. 5 kilo ohm resistance. Right? The moment you put a 5 kilo ohm or 10 kilo ohm resistance, then what will happen? The, the current that can flow through this is going to be restricted. Now, what will happen? Look at that 1 voltage difference divided by 5000. 5000. Right? 5000. 5000 means, uh, let's say, if it is 1000, it's 0.2. So, 2 into 10 to the power minus 4 amperes, minus 4 amperes, right, it is 200 microampere. Let's change the maximum readings, it's not 5 microampere, let's say it's 500 microampere. For 500 microampere, still this one is so big. This is like, uh, if it is 2 times 1000, there is another 100, 200 times. 200 times. 200 times is much, much bigger than what it can bear. What will happen when this current goes through that? Sometimes it might get burnt. It might burn. Right. What will happen if, for example, let's say, what will happen if you take a, a, a gadget that works in battery, you connect it to a main current. When, when, when it works in, let's say, 1.5 voltage current, you go and connect it to the main current, it immediately burns. Whatever the parts inside that will immediately burn. Right? A similar situation will happen here. When, when you give such a big current, the parts might get burnt or it might get distorted, damaged. To prevent all that, we put a big resistance here. That's fine, it will be prevented. But the problem is, let's say now, the difference between this point and this point has become 0.1 voltage. A small difference or 0 0.01 voltage. 0 0.01 voltage still is a difference, right? Then let's see how much current is going to flow. If you divide this by 5000, one hundredth of this, right? 2 microampere is what is going to flow through this. 2 microampere. I'm, I'm neglecting that 10 ohm, it has to be 5000 and 10 ohm, right? The galvanometer's resistance. In a 500 microampere scale, full scale, 2 microampere might almost look like 0. 500 is the maximum scale. It shows uh, uh, 2, 2 microampere. Out of 500, 2 can be very, very small, right? If you look at the scale, 0 is here. This is where you have 500. So, where would you have 2? Very close to 0. So, the indicator is going to be here, which might almost look like 0. But it is not actually zero. So what we will do when the when the indicator comes, the index comes closer and closer to zero, then we will short circuit this. We will have a plug key here, a key that we can just switch on by inserting, we can switch it on. So you put a plug key and close it. Then what happens? This side is short circuited, right? Then the current wouldn't go through this, all the current would come on this side. Because short circuit, very low, very low resistance, almost zero resistance. Current flows, it sees a 5 kilo ohm resistance, zero resistance on the other side. Which one would it go? It would go through zero resistance. So now look at the current. Even though the voltage difference is 0 0.01 voltage, how much is the resistance in between these two points? Here no resistance. Here 10 ohm resistance, 0 0.01 over 10, it will show you 1 milliampere or 1000 microampere, it will show you full scale reading. Right, 500 milliampere is the maximum reading, 1000 means it will, it will just touch the full scale and, and it will remain there. Why I am telling that is, see, when the, when the point becomes closer to zero, then we can short, we have to short circuit this big resistance and find the exact point where it becomes zero more precisely, more precisely. So we call this as, Safety setup for this galvanometer. Initially, we will remove the plug and keep this side open so all the current has to go through this 5 kilo ohm resistance. After we have found an approximate point where the index is very close to zero, then you short circuit this resistance and find the exact uh, point where it becomes zero. 
So this is a setup here after in every experiment I use galvanometer. High sensitive center zero galvanometer when I use it, I'll, I'll, I'll be using this extra setup with the galvanometer. Clear to protect the galvanometer from high power, high, high current. Right, so I will not be explaining this again and again. Now I have explained. So I, I as I always say, when you study these uh, experiments, you have to study in the order. At least, okay, if you have taken this section, forget about previous sections, if you have come into electricity section, you have to start from each experiment one by one. Because what I have already explained in the first electricity experiment, I might use it in the second one. What I already explained in the second one, I might go faster in the third one. Right, so within a section, don't jump the order. Please study in the order that we have done the experiments for you. Right, so this is what the galvanometer and its safety. I have already shown you the theory how we are going to use it here. Let's see that a little more into that. Let's just quickly go through that once again. Materials and apparatus required. A meter bridge, unknown resistance, a resistor box. In the previous experiment, I explained the difference between resistor box and a rheostat. Both you can have variable resistance, but rheostat, you cannot find the value of resistance that you are using. But if it is a resistor box, you know the amount of resistance that you are using. So even though both are variable resistors, when you need to know the amount of resistance that you are using, resistor box is preferable. Resistor box is preferable. Why do I know, need the value of R? Why do I need the value of R? The formula was this, 1 over L equals 1 over uh, 100x into R plus 1 over 100. This is what I take in the x-axis, R value. So I need the value of R. I need the value of R. Resist the box. If you write rheostat or variable resistance, no marks for that point. No marks. High sensitive center zero galvanometer, two voltage battery, two plug keys, sliding contact, five kilo ohm resistance connecting wires. You know why this five kilo ohm resistance is required. That's all the materials required for this experiment. Theory. When electric potential is applied across two resistors in series, the drop of potential in each resistor will be proportionate to their respective resistance. That's why I was able to write X over R and other side L over 100 minus L. Right? Say so this is X, this is R. Straight away you can say X over R in that ratio only. If, if, if galvanometer shows zero reading, then these two points have same potential. So if we have V here, here also it must be V. If you have V dash here, here also it must be V dash, right? So you can say V over V dash, right? If you take the current through this one as I1, if you take the current through this one as I2, V is going to be I1x, right? I1x. V dash is the same current, right? Same current, I because when it is zero reading, the current doesn't flow this line. So whatever the current went through has to go through here also, I1, so I1R. Here you can write I2 into, uh, if I take unit length resistance as K, the resistance here is going to be KL, let's say KL, L is uh, length, then I can say I2 into KL. Here same current I2 because there is no current here. 0 reading, I2 into, if this is L, this has to be 100 minus L. 100 minus L is the length, per centimeter K is the resistance, multiply by K. I2 into K, 100 minus L. I1, I1 cancels X over R, I2K, I2K cancels L over 100 minus L. This is what I straight away have written there. I said you can straight away write it as proportion and you don't have to mark the current and all. Straight away you can say the voltage drop in each resistance which are in series is same as uh, the proportion between the resistance. From that only we got that equation. X over R is L over 100 minus L. Then we inverted it. 100 minus L over L is R over X. 1 over L equals 1 over 100 X into R plus 1 over 100 Y equals MX plus C. Gradient of the graph is 1 over 100 L. Intercept of the graph is 1 over 100. That is if L is in centimeters. If L is in meters, you wouldn't have these two hundreds. You will have just 1 over X into R plus 1 would be there if you have done this in meters. Method. 
arrange the meter bridge and the other apparatus as shown in the diagram. I have drawn it and explained it to you. Set the resistor box at 10 ohm, insert the plug key K2 and move the sliding contact on the string until galvanometer shows approximate 0. Even though we say sliding contact, we don't slide it because this is a metallic top we have. The sliding contact, the tip is going to be metal. With that metal, if you keep sliding on the string again and again, the, the string will get affected, it will get damaged. So its cross section will not remain the same always if you keep on you know scratching on it. So better thing if this is a string, don't don't you know slide on that even though the name is sliding and then you touch at a point, get the reading if it is not zero, touch it here, touch it here, touch it here. Take it and touch it rather than just sliding on it to prevent any damage on that string. Approximately zero. Then short circuit five kilo ohm resistance. That safety resistance short circuit. That after finding the approximate zero point, and find out the point where the galvanometer shows zero reading. Measure the length L of the string and note it down. Repeat this process by changing the resistance of the resistor box and record the values of R and L to draw the graph. That's it. So change the value of R, you know, to different five different values, and each time find and uh, find the length L. R and L are there. Then we had to calculate one over L then 1 over L versus R graph can be drawn. Very simple. It's very simple. Right? Shall we, shall we see how we are going to do this experiment now? So the apparatus required for this experiment, primarily you need this meter bridge. Right? Let's try to understand the meter bridge properly. Can you see there is a string here, right? Which is of uniform cross section. Ah, uh, this is a resistance, right? In between these two points, we will be connecting the battery. Suppose if I connect the plus side here and minus side here, let's say if I'm giving four voltage, just assume it's four voltage. So if, if I assume this point to be zero voltage, uniformly it will increase across this string up to this point, four voltage. If you take in the middle, it will be two voltage, right in the middle. Right, there is this uh, meter meter tape also, right, meter ruler. So we can measure the distance from both sides. One, two, three, it starts from here and 100 here. Similarly, one, two, three from here, it goes all the way to 100 on the other side. Right, so I can measure length from, I can read length from both sides. So what you need to understand, it's a uniform string so that the voltage drops uniformly across this string. Then in parallel to that, there is another circuit you can see like this, parallel to this. So in between, see these two points, we can connect anything, maybe two resistances or maybe any other apparatus we can connect here. So when I am using this meter bridge in a circuit, I will explain you how, uh, how we are going to use these two openings, right. So that is the meter bridge for you and these are the connecting wires we will be using, connecting wires and this is the resistor box. We have not used resistor box in the previous experiment. Previously we have used the rheostat. In rheostat you can change the resistance but you would not know the value of resistance you are using. How much resistance is being used you would not know in a rheostat. Whereas a resistant box, resistant box you can change the resistance. You can see here, see there are numbers 1, 2, 2, 5. Likewise, there are numbers. Suppose if I remove this plug, right, if I remove this key, then I am using 2 ohm resistance from this box. If I, room, if I remove another 2 ohms, now 2 plus 2, 4 ohms resistance I am using from this. See, if I remove this one also, this is 50. So 50 and these two are both two, all together 54, 54 ohms, see, two, two and 50, all together 54 ohms I am using. Let's say I am plugging this in again, now I am using 52 ohms. So this is also a variable resistance and the advantage of resistance box compared to the rheostat is we know the value of resistance that we are using here. We know the value of resistance we are using here. 
So we will be using such a resistant box here, right? So this is what we call the contact key or we can call it sliding contact, right? I will show you when I am using it in the circuit, I will show you what is the benefit of, you, of this and how we can use this. This is the direct current voltage supply we are going to use here, right? You can see DC plus plus minus, right? And then we can change the voltage as we want. We can take 2 voltage, 4 voltage, 6 voltage, right? It has different options we have here. That is the voltage supply, direct current supply that we will be using here. This is what we call sender 0 galvanometer, sender 0 galvanometer, meaning it has, it has scales on both sides. Normally an ammeter, it is connected in series, this also connect, uh, has to be connected in series. But ammeter, there has to be one plus side, one minus side. On the plus side, the voltage has to be higher, minus side, the voltage has, has to be lower and there will be a, there will be a current uh, flow. But this one, whichever the side there is higher voltage, does not matter, you can connect these two anyway, you can connect these two anyway, you will get the uh, uh, readings here. So whichever the direction current flows, this will show you the reading, send a 0 galvanometer, right? And this is a high resistance, 500 ohm resistance. Thing is, this is a high sensitive galvanometer. So through this galvanometer, if high current flows, the galvanometer might be damaged. So we have to ensure high current does not flow through galvanometer. So what we do, we connect this resistance in series to this galvanometer. So, so that the, the current is always at a low point, at a low, low, low level. Once we found the approximate equilibrium point, at equilibrium point what happens? The current flow is very low, it is almost zero. So once we found the equilibrium point, then we will short circuit this, so that the current flows directly. Until we find the approximate equilibrium point, the current has to go through this resistance, that is why we are using this. 500 ohm or sometimes we can even use 1 kilo ohm resistance. After finding the approximate equilibrium point or equipotential point, then we are going to shortcut this, right? To shortcut that, we will be using this insert key. Again, when I am connecting it in the circuit, I will show you how, how we are going to use this. You know the function of insert key. If I remove this, if I remove this, then the, then the circuit is open. The current would not flow through that. Once I insert this key in, then the circuit will be complete. It will be a closed circuit and the current flow will happen. This is what we call insert key. And this is another type of switch. We call it tap switch. How we use tap switch is, see like once we connect the circuit, the current should not continuously flow through this string. Because what happens is the string will get heated and it will change the behavior of this string. The, the, the resistance, uh, the heat resistivity and everything will change after that. So to ensure the current does not continuously flow through this, we will be using this tap switch. When we want the current to flow, we will, we will close this and then the current will flow. I will show you how it works. See, can you see here, there is a gap, there is a gap here, right? When we touch here, the gap gets closed, then the circuit will be closed. See, when I touch here, circuit will be closed. When I take my hands, circuit is open because this, this gap increases and the circuit will be open. So whenever I want the current to flow, I can just touch here, just touch here, circuit is getting closed and the current flow will happen, right? That is how the tap switch works. And this is the unknown resistance, right? This is the resistance. I do not know the value of it, this is the resistance that we are going to find, okay. Sometimes in the experiments we might be using a, a copper coil or some other metal coil to find the resistance of it, even that is fine. Here I have taken this resistance, I do not know the value of it, that is what we are going to find in this uh, experiment. And as I always say, 
in in physics we don't just take one value and come to the conclusion what do we do wherever possible we go for a graphical method we go for a graphical method of doing the experiment so that the answer we get from the graph the calculations we do from the graph will be accurate rather than relying upon one value one set of value and getting the answer doing it repeatedly going for a graph and from the graph if we can take the values it will be more reliable so here also we are going to take a graphical approach after i connect the circuit i'll explain the concept and how it works let's first see how we are going to make the circuit connected right so let me first connect the power supply to the meter bridge see how it works i'm taking the plus right this is the power supply from the power supply i'm taking the plus let's connect it to the switch the tap switch right and then connect it to the plus side of it you can connect it to either side i have taken the plus here i have taken the plus here yes right and then the minus side we will connect it to the other end of this string right so now you can see circuit is complete right how it is complete the plus goes through here it comes to the left end my my left side end of the string through the string it goes all the way so that is the resistance the string is the resistance so through the resistance through the string the the voltage will drop suppose let's say if i select it at 4 voltage yeah it's at 4 voltage assuming this side is zero then this will be 4 voltage 4 because this is the plus side 4 voltage 4 right uniformly that will drop 4 voltage will uniformly drop and at this point it will become zero so if you take the midpoint say 50 cm point 50 cm point it will be 2 voltage 2 voltage if you take 25 cm point on this side that will be 3 voltage 4 3 2 1 Zero, four. After twenty-five centimeters, it will be three voltage. After another twenty-five centimeters, it will be two voltage. After twenty-five centimeters, it will be one voltage, and then it will be zero voltage. So uniformly, it drops. Now, what happens? Parallel to this string, there is another connection. Parallel to this string, these connectors. Look at these silver, silver-coated connectors. these connectors since their cross section is big the resistance is negligible so you can assume all these silver coated connectors they are actually silver coated copper connectors so their resistance is negligible right in between these two openings in between these two openings i can connect two resistances i can connect two resistances so imagine i have connected 5 ohm here and another 5 ohm here 5 5 if i connected equal resistance to both of these openings then in this side of the circuit since all other connectors do not have resistance i can expect the four voltage to equally fall into the resistances 5 ohm 5 ohm 1 is to 1 4 voltage 2 voltage here 2 voltage here which means at this point the voltage has to be right half of it 4 voltage half of that Two voltage must be the uh, potential here, right? Okay. Similarly, in this string also, uniformly the voltage drops. So if you take the midpoint, fifty centimeter point, that also should have two voltage because altogether four voltage. Right at the midpoint, you will have two voltage. So imagine if you connect these two points. That means five ohm here, five ohm here, and then you take the midpoint. take the mid point here as well connect them they must be equipotential points that means the potential at both points are two voltage which means if you connect galvanometer in between these two there shouldn't be a current flow because both are same potential two voltage two voltage there can't be a flow of current so galvanometer will show a zero reading zero reading 
If you keep galvanometer on this side, it will have a reading because if you connect these two points, okay, this is 2 voltage. Let's say you connected 25 centimeter here, then that is 3 voltage. 3 voltage, 2 voltage, there will be a current flow. Say you took this point and connected 25 centimeter from this side, then 2 voltage, this will be 1 voltage because 4, 3, 2, 1, this will be 1 voltage. 2 voltage, 1 voltage, there will be a current flow. So if you connect the galvanometer between this point and any other points on this string, there is going to be a current flow. Write the midpoint 50 centimeter, 2 voltage, 2 voltage, galvanometer will not show any current flow. Suppose you have used 1 is to 3, let's say you have kept 5, volt, 5 ohms here and 15 ohms here, 1 is to 3. Then the 4 voltage supply, you will have 1 voltage falling in here and 3 voltage falling in here because the resistance is going to be 1 is to 3 ratio, then the voltage drop also will be 1 is to 3 ratio. 4 voltage, 1 here, 3 here. That means 4, 1 less, this point has to be 3 voltage. 3 voltage. Similarly, on this string also, 25 centimeter point is going to have 3 voltage. Then these two points are equipotential. If you connect those two with the galvanometer, there should not be a current flow. Understand? So this way, what we can say here, the ratio between these two resistances and the ratio between the length of two parts of this. How comes two parts? You find the equipotential point. See, when it was equipotential 25 centimeter, 25 to 75. Then the resistance also has to be 1 is to 3. Suppose equipotential point in between this one and this one, there is no current flow. Let's say this is at 40 centimeter, then 40, 60. Then the resistance ratio also must be 40, 60. Simplify 40, 60, 2 is to 3. See, you get the equipotential at the midpoint, 50, 50. Then the resistance must be equal. Let's say you get the equipotential from this point to this point is at 75 centimeter. Then 75, 25. That must be the ratio between these two resistances. Right, so this is the concept that we are going to use in this meter bridge. What is it? The ratio between these two resistances that I am going to connect here. I have not yet connected. The ratio between these two resistances and then I will be finding an equipotential point in between this and another point. And then the ratio between those lengths will be equal. Alright, so if I want to find an unknown resistance, fix it here and fix, an, fix a known resistance here. Right, so let's say this is X and this is known resistant R, X to R ratio. Find the equilibrium point, say that is at L, L to 100 minus L, because altogether 100 centimeter. L, 100 minus L. X, R, R is a known resistance. X to R equals L to 100 minus L. We can use that equation and find the value of X. Actually, with one value itself, we can do it. With one value itself, we can do it, but to get the, to improve the precision of the answer, what we will be doing, we will be taking several values like that, four or five sets of values. We will be changing the known resistance. That's why we are going to use the resist the box. You change the known resistance to different, different values and find the equilibrium length L and then we will go into a graphical method so that the final answer you get is improved in terms of precision. Now let's connect the resistances here. This is the unknown resistance. Let me connect it in this gap. Right. And then the resistor box, which will have known resistance, I'm going to connect in this gap. This gap. Right. 
So I have connected a known resistance. I can remove these keys and I can make it a known resistance. This is the unknown resistance. Now to find the equipotential point, I need to connect the galvanometer. See known resistance, unknown resistance, known, unknown. To find equipotential point, I need a galvanometer because I need to find zero current flow in between this point and wherever a point on this string, there is going to be an equipotential point, right? To find that galvanometer. Look at this, I'll just, just connect it simply and show you how we are going to use the galvanometer. Then I'll show you, then I'll show you how we are going to protect the galvanometer. So first if I simply connect it, look at this, without any protection, now I am connecting it. Not to worry because the circuit is not given the power supply. Okay, see I am taking it from here and then I'll take the sliding contact. Let's connect the sliding contact here to the other side. Now you can see I have connected between this point and the galvanometer and the sliding contact. What will happen after the circuit is switched on? Now I have not switched on. I will be touching this at different, different points to find out where there is zero current flow through the galvanometer, right? After I, I connected everything, after I have given the power supply, I will show you. There will be only one point where I, I touch this, there will be zero current flow on this. All other points, it will have either positive current or negative current flowing through this. But the problem is, I can't just connect it like this because this is a high sensitivity galvanometer. If a high current flows through this, then this will be damaged. So to avoid that, what do we do? We will keep another high resistance in series with this. So see how we are going to keep that. I have this 500 ohms. Let's connect that here. Right. By connecting this 500 ohm in series to this galvanometer, in series to this galvanometer. Look at this. From here, it comes to the 500 ohms and then to the galvanometer. Then I'll be touching at different, different points. By connecting it in series, I'm protecting the galvanometer from high current. But after I have found the approximate equilibrium point where the current is almost zero, then I don't need this. So at that point, we can shortcut this, short circuit this. How do we short circuit that? We'll be using this plug switch for that. We'll be using the plug switch for that. See how I connect the plug switch. Right, see, in parallel to the resistance, I'm connecting the plug switch. What will happen? Normal circumstances, I will remove this key and keep this plug switch open. Plug switch pl or plug key open means or insert key, you can call it plug switch or insert key. So if the insert key is open, meaning it has infinity resistance, the current wouldn't flow through that. Current would flow through the other resistance. After you have found the approximate equilibrium point, then you close this. Once you close this, it becomes zero resistance. Then the current wouldn't flow through the resistance, it will go through this short circuit. Right, so that's how we protect the galvanometer. Clear? So with that, our circuit is ready. We can, we can use it. So first what we do, make sure your, your insert key is open. Now we can switch on the supply and we can check. This is how we check. When I touch this sliding contact on this side, the galvanometer would show the reading on one side. If I touch it on the other end of the meter bridge, galvanometer has to show the reading on the other side. Then we know the circuit is correct and there is going to be some equilibrium point somewhere in between. Also, I have to remove a, a plug from here. Look at this. 
I don't know the value of this. I don't know the value of this. So what we will do, we will just randomly start with 10 ohms, right? Let me remove 10 ohm from here. Let me remove 10 ohm from here. See, I have taken off 10. That means this resistance, capital R is 10 ohms, 10 ohms, right? Let's start with 10 ohm and then let's see whether we have to increase it or decrease it for the following readings. I'm planning to take five different readings, five different readings. So let's see whether it works. Now let's power on the supply. So what I'm going to do, I'll, I'll be touching this uh, sliding contact on both sides of this meter bridge. And I should be able to see the galvanometer showing the reading in two different sides. Right, let's see. If I keep it on the right side here and close the tap switch, you can see I get a minus reading. I'm not continuously closing it and keeping it. I told you the reason. There shouldn't be current flow continuously through this string. So just keep it here. Just touch it and see. Okay, we get a minus. Minus on this side, minus. Now we'll see on the other side. If I keep it here, you can see it shows a plus side read. Yeah, plus side read. Which, which means circuit is properly connected. There has to be some equilibrium point in the uh, 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 middle of it. Let's check somewhere around, let's say 60. Still minus. Still minus. Ah, that seems to be close to zero. Look at this. If I keep it at 30, it's plus. Can you see? Close to, close to 40, I get a zero point. Close to 40. So now what we will do, I understand approximately it is at 40. Approximately it's at 40. I'm going to close this uh, insert key so that this resistance can be shortcut. Let's close this, right. Now let's go back to that approximate point. It was at 40. Look at this, I keep it at 41, it's a minus current. Right, at this point I get a zero. I get a zero here, which is at 41 point. It's at 41.5 centimeter. When I use 10 ohms here in the resistant box, right, that is a known resistant. When I use 10 ohms in this, the equilibrium point I'm getting is at 41.5 centimeter. 41.5 centimeter. Shall we double check again? 41.5. You can see at 41.5, it's zero. Yes, 41.5 centimeter. That means from the unknown resistance side, it is 41.5. So if I write an equation now, if the unknown resistance is x, x over 10, x over 10 equals 41.5 from this side, 100 minus 41.5 from the other side. That's 48.5 or 58.5. 41.5. 58.5, the ratio 41.5 to 58.5, that is in the string. On the other parallel circuit, it's x over 10. I can use that and find x. But still, we are not going to conclude with one reading because we are going for a graphical approach. So let's write this down first. When, when this is 10 ohms, 
41.5 uh, centimeter equilibrium point we are getting. After that, we are going to change this resistance to different different values. Now, now based on this, you can say the value of this resistance has to be less than 10, isn't it? Because I'm using 10 here. For 10, we get 58.5 centimeters. For that x, we get 41.5 centimeters. So x must be a smaller resistance, right? So after 10 ohm, I'm going to take a smaller value of resistance here. Maybe I can bring it down to 8 ohms, 5 ohms and see what happens. So let's first write it down, 10 ohms, 41.5 centimeters. So R is 10 ohm, we have used 10 and L was 41.5, 41.5. So we understand this resistance, unknown resistance has to be something less than 10 ohms. So next time I'm going to take 8 ohms from the resistant box and see the equilibrium point. Let's take 8 ohms. So you know how to take 8 ohms. Now let me insert this 10 ohm back. Let's insert it. If I want to take 8 ohms, let me take 5 1 and a 2. So altogether 5, 2 and 1 altogether 8 ohms have been removed. 8 ohms. Make sure all other keys are inserted tight. Right. Now let me check the circuit again but before, before, before uh, checking the circuit, make sure the insert key has to be removed from here so that the current flows through the, the resistance so that the galvanometer is protected. Let's check from both sides. Let me keep it here. We have a minus current. You can see the galvanometer, minus current. On the other side, it's a plus current. So there has to be an equilibrium point somewhere. Let me check around 60, still minus, 50, still minus. There you go, somewhere around that, see it's, it's, it's plus on this side. So somewhere around 47, 48, 49, right, yeah around, Yes, around 55, 56, we get a zero point, isn't it? Around 55, 56, we are getting a zero point. So now what we will do, we have found the approximate point. Let's insert this again. Let's insert this again. Right, now let's check where it is exactly. Around this point, we are getting zero. That is at 47, 47.1 centimeter, we are getting zero. 47.1 centimeter. That is when, when I used eight ohms on the resistor box. Resistor box, when we used eight ohms, we get 47.1 centimeter equilibrium. Let's write it down. When I used 8 ohms, 8 ohms, 47.1, 47.1. So still the resist, the unknown resistance has to be smaller than, smaller than 8 ohm because 8 ohm has taken more than 47.1 because out of 100 centimeter, 47.1 on this side means 52.9 on this side. So 8 ohms proportionate to 52.9. And this unknown resistance must be 47.1 proportionate to that. So still it is less than 8. So what I am going to do next time, I am going to take 5 ohms from this or even 6 ohms. I will take 6 ohms from this 
and see the reading I'm getting from that, right? Six ohms. So I already have taken five, two and one. So let me insert this two back. Then what will happen? I'll have only five and one, which is six ohms, five and one. Remove the insert key. Make sure the galvanometer is protected. Double check now on this side, minus plus. So there has to be an equilibrium point somewhere. Let's check minus, 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 ah, somewhere around this point is going to be 0. See, around 53 we are getting 0, around 53. Insert the insert key, right. Now let's check. That's a point where you are getting 0 which is exactly 53 centimeters, exactly 53 centimeters. That means when you are using 6 ohms, you are exactly getting 53 centimeters. Let's write it down, 6 ohms, 6 ohms, 53 centimeters, 53 centimeters, right? Let's take another couple of values, maybe we can check 4 ohms, yeah, 4 ohms, let's check. Let me, let me insert this 5 back and then let's insert 1, so now 2 and 2, 4 ohms, 4 ohms. With those 4 ohms, let's check, remove the insert key again until you find the approximate equilibrium point, minus current, plus current, yes. At 60, it's minus, it's plus, so it has to be somewhere around 59 we are getting. Insert key, so that we can, we can short circuit this resistance, so more current comes now. Right, that is the point where you get 0, that is 58.4 centimeters, 58.4 centimeters at 58.4 centimeters. That is, when we use 4 ohms on the resistance box, we are getting 58.4 centimeters, 58.4. Let's take one more point, maybe 2 ohms we will take, 2 ohms. How do you get 2 ohms from the resistance box? You can see, let's put these 2 ohms in, so only this has been removed which means 2 ohms will be the resistance on this box. Remove the insert key, protect the galvanometer, check both sides, minus, check on this side, plus, so there has to be an equilibrium point somewhere, at 65 it is plus, at 70 it is minus, Somewhere around 67 it comes to 0 approximately, right? Let's increase the current by short circuiting this resistance at 67 plus. Right, that's the point where it comes to 0. That is at 67.3 centimeters. 67.3 centimeters. When you use 2 ohms on this resistance box, you get 67.3 centimeters equilibrium point. 2 ohms, 67.3 centimeters. So now we have taken 5 different known resistance values and the, the equilibrium point distance on the unknown resistance side, the length at which the equilibrium or equipotential point is, we have found that. Now let us take all these values, we will, we will change it into a graph format, we will draw a y equals mx plus c graph and see how from the graph we can precisely find this 
unknown resistance. Students, you can see the readings I have got. We have noted down in this table. R and L we have. You know the formula. Formula is uh, 1 over L equals 1 over 100 X into R plus 1 over 100. So, we need 1 over L, right? 1 over L. 1 over L, right? So, it is going to be 1 over 41.5. Let us take 1000 over 41.5 and we say this is into 10 to the power minus 3, right, centimeter minus 1, okay. So, 1000 divided by 41.5, right, let us divide this to will be 830, 170. 4, 4 is uh, uh, 1660, 40, 400.0, another 0 you put, it will be 9, correct, 955, 35, 39, yeah, 24.09, into 10 to the power minus 3, which I have put in the bracket, the other one. 1000 divided by 47.1 to 800, see 2124958. Correct? Uh, 471, yes. 5800 will have, uh, we can have. 5, 580, 580 will have 1, 471, then you have 910.2942148, that is going to be 4 approximately, no, 3, 3, 21.23. Next one, 1053. 153, 47, 0, 9, would it be enough? No, 8, 24, 4, then you have 46, 46 will have uh, 9, would it be enough? No, 8, 424, 36, 36 will approximately have 7. Next one, 58.4, 1, 4, 1, 6, uh, 7, 7 would be enough, 28, 2, 58, 5, 40, 2, 7, 0. 720 is 1, 1360 is 2, 17.12 into 10 to the power minus 3 and the last one is 67.3, 67.3, 1, uh, this will be 5, 4, 26, 8, 7, 5, 5, 7, 80, that is going to be 9 won't be enough, isn't it? 8, 24, 2, 58, 58, 5, 53, 6, 9, 6, 3, 3, 3, 9, 60, uh, can say approximately 6, 14.86. Cool. So, those are the 1 over L values we have got, R and 1 over L. With these values, we can draw the graph.
we don't need the intercept only the gradient so you don't have to you don't necessarily have to stretch up to 0 but anyway r starts from 2 ohm so we can have x axis from 0 to 10 x axis we'll have 0 to 10 y axis 24.09 14.86 so let's say we can start at 14.5 and we can finish it at 24.5 we can finish it at 24.5 approximately. Yes. Okay. Let's draw the graph and see. That's the x axis and then the y axis. Zero, one, two, three, four. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We have up to 10. That's enough. That's enough. That is R in ohms. Y axis we have 1 over L that is in 10 to the power minus 3 centimeter minus 1. 10 to the power minus 3 centimeter minus 1. We are not starting from 0, so let us break the axis. If I start from here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 points we can take. 18 points. If I take each of them as 0. 0.5, we can take up to 9. 9 would not be enough. I need from 14.5 to 24.5. Can we make 20 scales? Can manage, yes. So, we will do this. Let this be 24.5. No, 14.5. Then, this will be 15. This will be 16. 17. 18. 19. 20. 21, 22, 23, this point is going to be 24 and this point, see I will extend this graph. This is where 24 is, this is where 24.5 is. One over L into ten to the power minus three centimeter minus one. Right, good. Scale is good. Now the points ten and forty-one point five, not forty, twenty-four point zero nine. I need to take this in the x-axis, this in the y-axis. Ten, twenty-four point zero nine, twenty-four point zero nine, twenty-four point zero nine at ten. Ten. 24.0, just above 24, right? Almost at that point, 0 0.09, 0 0.09. Yeah, a little bit more, we can say, 24.09. Right. Next, 8 and 21.23, 8 and 21.23, 21.23, okay. 8, this is 8, this is 21, 21.23. Here. Next, 6 and 18.87, 6 and 18.87, 6, 18.87, like that, 4 and 17.12, 4, 17.12, 4, 17.12, right, next, 2 and 14.86, 2 and 14.86, 14.5, that is how we get the points approximately, yes, let us draw the graph, it is almost a straight line, we can, we can see a correlation there, let us draw a graph.
or maybe we can take that as the outlier. Yeah, this seems to be a better graph. That seems to be a better graph. See, it covers three points in it. Two points are away from the uh, graph. One is a little bit below the graph. The other one is a little bit above the graph. We need gradient. So, you do not you don't need the intercept. You do not have to extend it. We just need the gradient. Get two points where it, it, it intersects at a cross section of uh, uh, vertical line and horizontal line. Then we can easily get the scales. See, this is one point I can take. 3 and 16, 3 and 16, then check whether you have any other points like that. See this point, which is uh, 60 or 10.5, 11 and 24, 11 and 24. So, the gradient is going to be the difference in y, 24 minus 16. But careful that is in centimeter minus 1, 10 to the power minus 3. Multiply by 10 to the power minus 3 over difference in x, 11 minus 3. This is 8, this is also 8. We get 1 into 10 to the power minus 3. And this m has to be equal to, according to our equation, m has to be equal to, where is m? 1 over 100x. So, I can write this is 1 over 100x. So, from this you can say 100 x must be equal to the inverse of this that is going to be 1 into 10 to the power plus 3. So, x is going to be 10, 10 ohms, 10 ohms approximately 10 ohms we get. x has to be approximately 10 ohms. Clear? Clear? Look at the readings again. Look at the readings again. Right. That is what we get based on these values. The graph we have drawn, we get approximately 10 ohm as the resistance, uh, the unknown resistance we have used. Right? Values apart, did you understand the method? How we use the meter bridge and what values we have recorded? So be very careful when they say, when they ask in the exam what readings you will get from the experiment, it must be something straight away you read there, not something you come back and calculate. So, if, you, if they ask what is the reading you get, you say 1 over L, wrong. You get the reading L. Then we calculate 1 over L based on that. So, we be very careful when they ask what readings do we get, what measurements do we get. You have to give something that straight away without before any calculation you can get from the experiment. That is what you call readings. Right? In another experiment, they asked, uh, uh, say that we had to find the diameter of a, of a string and then we had to calculate the area cross-sectional area and that A will be used in calculations. So, when they ask okay, what are the measurements you get, some students have written A, area. You do not measure the area of the string. You measure using the vernier caliper, you measure the uh, vernier caliper or, or uh, micrometer screw gauge. You can, you can measure the diameter of the, not even radius, not even radius, the diameter that we measure. So, only for the diameter, they have given marks. Any other wordings like radius or area, they did not give marks because they asked what measurements we get, not calculated answers. So, just be familiar with those kind of terms that they use in the exam. But apart from all that, it is a very simple experiment that we can use. Clear? Practice this very well. Now, what we are going to do? We are going to see some past paper questions that have come in this section. All right, students. So, now, let us see some past paper questions that have come from this particular experiment. First, I have taken a very old paper 1982. Let us see what does uh, it say. Both ends of a metal string with uniform cross section are connected together to form a circular ring. Two sliding clips are also attached in this ring. The distance between the two clips along the string is 1 meter. The length of the string is 1 meter. Uh, this is L meter, that is 1 meter, and its diameter is 0.75 millimeter. These clips are connected to the right side space of a meter bridge as shown in the diagram above. Right. Understand now, now this is a meter bridge, right? This is a meter bridge. 
right this is the string on the meter bridge this is the right side gap there are two gaps in the meter bridge you can see so this is where they have connected the particular uh, string or ring or whatever they say let me explain that to you they have a string which they have connected together so it, it makes a ring now it makes a ring right the total length of the string is 1 meter. So, all together it is 1 meter. All together it is 1 meter. And then there are two clips on it. Let me mark that with a different color. There are two clips on it. Two clips. The length along the string in between these clips is L meter. So, if this is L, the balance has to be 1 minus L meter, 1 minus L meter, correct, 1 minus L meter. Now, that, that is what they have connected here, the two, two, uh, uh, two clips are here. So, they have connected these two points in the gap here, understand. These clips are connected to the right side space of a meter bridge as shown in the diagram above. Clear? Right. Meter bridge is used to find the resistance S between the clips. Write down a formula for S at the balancing point shown in the diagram. Right. So, so the resistance between these two points, right, the resistance in between these two points is what they mark as S. So, understand that resistance is going to be there is one part of string up there, there is another part of string here. So, it is going to be something like this. Look at this. I can, I can draw it like this. See? Two resistance and in between those two. This upper resistance is the resistance of this L meter. Right? L meter. So, if I assume unit length resistance as k, the resistance of this L meter will be LK. And here it is going to be 1 minus L meters multiplied by the unit length resistance 1 minus L into k. So, there are two resistors parallel to each other. The resultant of those two is what you call S. And they are trying to find S. Come back here. Meter bridge is used to find the resistance S between the clips. Write down a formula for S at the balancing point shown in the diagram. So, very simple. Now, now the resistance between these two points is R. These two points is S. Correct. So, I can say R over S equals on this side. See, parallel to R, the balancing length you get is L1. On the other side, you get L2. Right. How this comes is this way. You can say, uh, see, these two points are EQ potential. When galvanometer shows you zero reading, these two points are also EQ potential. So, the potential difference between these two points and these two points must be equal. These two points means if I assume the current through the first like top line as I1, I1R, that is the voltage drop between these two points. And the voltage drop between these two points, if I assume it to be KL1, K is a voltage gradient, voltage gradient per, per centimeter or per meter, how much voltage drops, we call it voltage gradient, voltage gradient into L1. Similarly, for the other one, you can write because here also the voltage drop between these two and these two must be equal because these two are EQ potential points. Since galvanometer shows zero reading, this also should be EQ potential. So, the differences must be same. So, here is going to be I1S and same gradient you have because same current goes through KL2. When you divide that, you will end up with this R over S equals L1 over L2. Since they ask, write down a formula, you do not have to derive it. If they say derive the formula, you have to write down all this and get it. But when they say write down the connection, you, you can just write this, right? Maybe we can make S the subject of it if you want. L2 over L1 R. S goes up, L2 L1 comes here. 
how would you check the circuit to ensure that it is possible to find the balancing point for all the definite values of L? See, what, what could be the definite values of L? Let's check that circuit again. Right, this is L. So, what could be the L minimum? L minimum is 0. You can bring them closer. Then L, L becomes 0. What could be the maximum of L? Not 1 meter. Because see, look at this. When, when, look at this, L and 1 minus L. Why 1 minus L? The other part of the string. When L is 0, 1 minus L is going to be 1 meter. When L is 0.25, this is going to be 0.75. When L is going to be 0.4, this is going to be 0.6. When L is going to be 0.5, this is going to be 0.5. When L increases to 0.6, 1 minus L will become 1.4. Then you can assume this to be L and this will become 1 minus L. So, the like same cases will repeat, right? So, one part of the length, you can assume the minimum is 0 and the maximum is 50. Maximum is 50. You don't have to consider anything beyond 50 because when you go beyond 50, same scenario repeats. For, for example, 40, 60, 60, 40, these two are same scenarios. Having 0.4 up, 0.6 down or having 0.6 up, 0.4 down. What's the difference? There's no difference, right? You will have the same resistance because here 0.6 is up, here 0.6 is down, 0.4 is up, 0.4 is down, doesn't make any difference because you are going to find the resistance, result and resistance between these two points, which is anyway 0 0.6, 0 0.4, here also 0 0.6, 0 0.4. So, uh, coming up to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is the maximum, beyond that you don't have to consider, right? So, I can say L maximum is 50 or 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 50 centimeter, let's say 0 0.5 meter, understand? So, you do not have to consider L being beyond 50 because L beyond 50 means 1 minus L is going to be less than 50. So, that will be a similar situation what, what you had before this. So, these are the possible like 0, 1, 50, 50. This is what would repeat in the other half also. Right. So, as long as you go up to 50 centimeter, that is enough. That is enough. You do not have to go beyond that because if you go beyond that, some, some situation you already had is going to repeat. For example, like I said, if you go to, if you increase the L to 0.6, 1 minus L is going to be 0.4, which is same as what we had here. If you increase this to 0.75, this is going to be 0.25, this is same as this one. Right. So, it is not a new scenario. So, new scenario will happen only, only from 0 to 50 when you increase it, not beyond 50. So, we can say, we can say, Right, let's write like this. Let me erase all this. How would you check the circuit to ensure that it is possible to find the balancing point for all definite values of L? Uh, set L equals 0 and check whether a uh, balancing point is obtained and also set L at 50 centimeter and check whether check whether a balancing point is obtained balancing point or you can say equilibrium point. If balancing point is obtained in both the above cases, both the above cases, then for any value of L, 
any value of L, uh, balance is possible. Next, how would you select the value of R to minimize the error in the measurement of S? How would you select the value of R? Look at this. Right, how would you select the value of R? We should select the value of R such that the balancing point comes somewhere close to the middle. Right, you should not let the balancing point to go to a corner. Then if, we, if it goes to a corner, the measurement you are going to take is going to be small. Then the fractional error will be high, L1 or L2 if it becomes small. Then the fractional error in that, because fractional error means error divided by the measurement you take. So if the measurement becomes smaller, fraction will increase. Understand? So to avoid that, we must try to get the balancing point somewhere in the middle so that L1, L2, both are sizable values that we get. So let's say R should be obtained or R should be selected such that either you can say L1 and L2 are becoming approximately equal or you can say the balancing point is close to the middle of the string such that the balancing point balancing point is close to the close to the close to the midpoint of the string of the string draw l versus s graph for the full range of l right uh, we'll we'll ha we'll have a look at it look at this so this is how the string is this is what l is so this is going to be 1 minus l so s means the resultant between these two so i can say s is going to be the resistance of this l shall i say lk where k is the resistance per unit length and it's parallel to 1 minus lk 1 minus l is the length here k is the unit length resistance right so you can say 1 over s will be equal to 1 over lk 1 minus lk 1 over s will be equal to right here you will get 1 minus l there you will get uh, uh, l so minus l cancel l 1 so it's a bit of a complicated formula because you get l and 1 minus l down there so it's it's definitely is not going to be a straight line okay this s is going to be l 1 minus l k simple you get 1 minus l here L there minus L plus L cancels, you just will have 1. So L into 1 minus L K. Right. So that that going through the formula could be a bit tricky here. When L increases, what happens to S? Let's look at some values. Look at this. Now, altogether it's altogether it's 100 centimeters, right? What happens when it is 10 and 90? When L is 10, when this is 90, S is going to be, if you put there, this is going to be 10, 1 minus L is going to be 90, 900 K, 10 and 90. What will happen when you put 20? 20 and 80, 1600 K. 30 and 70, 2100 K. 40 and 40? Uh, 40 and 60 it has to be. Why all together it has to be 100, right? 2400 K. 50 and 50? 2500 K. Then the same thing will repeat. Now if you put this to 60, 60 and 40, it will again become 2400. So I just have to draw only up to 50, right? Up to midpoint, 50 centimeter. Whatever the graph I have here will be just on the other side it returns. That's all. So here you can see it increases, but but look at the increment. When L increase from 10 to 20, here the increment is 700. 
But when it increases from 20 to 30, the increment is only 500. When it increases from 30 to 40, the increment is 300. So what happens? It increases, but increases the rate of increment slow, slows down. Initially, it increases very fast. Initially, it increases very fast. Then the increment reduces, reduces. After 50, 50, it is going to repeat the same numbers. So how you will have this? When it is 0, if you put 0 here, S is 0. So it starts from 0, 0 point. It goes up like this. Can you see? The rate at which it increases has to reduce. So the slope reduces, right? Look at this once again. Similar graph would repeat on the other side also. Once again. Right. It has to be a symmetric graph. For example, for 40, whatever the value you got and 60, whatever the value you get must be equal. For 20, whatever the value you get and for 80, whatever the value you get will be equal. Because when you put 20 here, 20 and 80 parallel. When you put 80 here, it's going to be again 80 and 20 parallel. Right. So, 20, 80 parallel, 80, 20 parallel. It's the same. It's the same. Doesn't make difference. So, you get a mirror image. First half of the graph, second half of the graph. Each a mirror image of each other. You don't need to, you know, show all this. Just the graph only they ask you to show. In a particular measurement, R was kept at 5 and L45. The values of L1 and L2 at the balancing point were 55 and 45 respectively. What is the resistance between the sliding clips? Basically, they are asking yes. So, we already have a formula. S equals L2 over L1 into R. We already took it, right? Where? S equals L2 over L1 R. L2, L2, 45. L1, 55. Correct? And R was kept at 5. R was kept at 5. So, that's going to be, if you cut this by 5, 45 by 11. 4 point, uh, 10, 0, 100, you can say 9. 4.09 ohms you get, 4.09 ohms you get. Use the above value of S to determine the resistivity of the material of string. Resistivity, resistivity means, you know, R equals rho L over A. They are asking about this rho. Now, this resistance we have got 45 over 11. What is this? Understand carefully. You have the string like this. You have two points. This side is 45 centimeter. This side is 55 centimeter. The, these, these two are like we can consider as two different resistors parallel, parallelly connected. 45 centimeter, 55 centimeter parallelly connected. The resultant of those two parallel resistance is going to be 4.09. Right. This is not the resistance of just one meter string. No, it's not one meter because you have connected them together. You have put a clip in between. So, it becomes two parts which are in parallel to each other. Right. So, let me put it this way. Huh? Let K be the resistance. per meter, right? Then I can say, now this is going to be 0.45 meter. So the resistance of this is 0.45 K. This is going to be 0.55 K. So what do you mean by S is 0.45 K and 0.55 K parallelly being connected, parallelly being connected. Now, we have solved this earlier. Look at this. L into 1 minus LK. L into 1 minus L. If I, if I take this as point, L is 0.45K. This is what we have got as 45 by 11. 45 by 11. Right? 45 by 11. So, you can get K. K is going to be, right? If you cut it here, this is 100, 100 over 
0.55 comes down here into 11, correct? I multiplied, I cut these to 100, 100 over 0.55, 11. And what is this K? K is the 1 meter length resistance. So again, bring that here. K, K is going to be rho 1 meter. Have they given the cross section area? Let's check. Point seven five millimeter. Can you see uh, the diameter is point seven five millimeter? So let's use that. A has to be pi point seven five by two. Did they say point seven five? Yes. Point seven five millimeter. Point seven five millimeter is the diameter. So I take the radius by dividing that by two, right? Squared. But careful, that's in millimeter. So let me put ten to the power minus six, because one millimeter, if you convert it to meter, ten to the power minus three. Squared makes it ten to the power minus six. I have to bring that value here. Not so easy. Not so easy. Look at this. So let it be a. Let's say. 100 over 0.55 into 11. So let's solve this now. All papers you had solvings like this. Maybe I can multiply this by 100 up and down, then it becomes 10 to the power 4, 55, 11. A is going to be pi. Pi is 22 by 7. 0 0.75, 0 0.75 by 2 by 2, 10 to the power minus 6. Now it's a matter of solving it. You have this will be two. Then, then you will have uh, if I if I divide this by uh, eleven or five, it's going to be eleven. Here you will have point one five. Correct. And then ten to the power four, ten to the power minus six, go on. You will have ten to the power minus two only. So, let's check the values now. It's going to be 15 into 75 over 11, 7, 4. Already 10 to the power minus 2 was there. Here I take another 2, 2. 10 to the power minus 6 will remain there. We have to solve this and get it. Check whether it is right. 10 to the power 4. Here I made it 15. So you need another 10 to the power minus 2. So from here you can say I have taken 100 and put it here to make it 15. I have taken another 100 to make it 75. So 10 to the power minus 6 remains as it is. Oh, there was a 2 here. So that 2 and this 2 has to be cancelled. Then this will be 2 only. Now we have to solve this. Solve this. I told you like old papers, they used to give uh, solvings like this. Multiply this 15 into 5, 75. 7 balance. 15 into 7 is 105 plus 7, 112. That has to be divided by 77 into 2, 154. 154. So this is not enough. Say for this one, 8, not enough. 7, 28, 2. 35 plus 2, 37, 3, 10. 7 balance, 4. 470, you will have 0.3. 2, 45, 46. 880, you can say 70 or, or you can say 70. And then next you will get around 5. So, 3, 1. 7.31 into 10 to the power minus 6 ohm meter, ohm meter. 7.31 into 10 to the power minus 6 ohm meter is the correct answer we get. Bit of a solving, understand what we have done here. First, you need to understand what the answer for S is, the resultant of these two resistance. 
So if this is 0.45k and if this is 0.55k, the parallel of those two, we can write like this where. Right, how did we get this? Already I have proven that SC equals L into 1 minus LK. If not, you can put 1 over SC equals 1 over first resistance plus 1 over second resistance. Keep solving, you will get this line. From this, you solve and K. K is this. What is K? The resistance of 1 meter. Because what, what we assumed as K is the resistance per length. So, R equals rho L over A. L has to be 1. A, we have to find it. A, we have to find it. A, I have written like this. Pi R squared. R is 0.75 millimeter. That's the diameter. When you say radius, you have to divide that by 2. And that's in millimeters. So, I, I do everything in meter. Converted that to meter. That's why that 10 to the power minus 6 come. Because meter squared, that makes it 10 to the power minus 6. So, substituted that. And bit of a, you know, solving there. When you solve it, rho is this. All right, so that's all in that 1982 paper. Uh, if at all the, the last calculation would have uh, been a little difficult for you, that's also just the solving part of it. So not much of marks will go into solving. And these days questions do not give you that much of numerical solving. So it's an, it's an easy or okay question that you have got in 1982, very long time back. Now let's see 1991. State Ohm's law. Ohm's law, we know what is Ohm law through Ohm's law through a conductor. If there is a current flow, the voltage across that conductor is proportionate to the current that flows through the conductor. V is proportionate to I. That's what Ohm's law is. And from that only we, then we derived V equals IR. The proportionate, we made it into equal by introducing a constant. That constant is what we call resistance of that conductor. But to say V proportionate to I, there are certain conditions as well. What conditions? Now think like this, V proportionate to I. Then you say V equals IR. So as long as that R is constant only, V will be proportionate to I. Think what are the circumstances that R can change? If the temperature of the conductor changes, with temperature R increases, we studied that. Uh, R theta equals R naught into 1 plus alpha theta. When theta increases, R increases. The dimensions, physical properties of it, because R is rho L over A. If L and A changes, suppose you can, you can uh, pull it, give some tension and extend the string. Then the length increases, cross section reduces. All that will have an impact on R. So V is proportionate to I, provided that physical conditions and the temperature remain constant. Let's write that. The voltage across a conductor conductor is proportionate to proportionate to the current flowing through the conductor, flowing through the conductor, provided that the temperature and physical properties physical properties of the conductor of the conductor remain unchanged or remain constant if you simply say v proportionate to i you don't get marks you have to write it like this then only you get marks Hmm. There are some circuit diagrams given, first one and second one. Let's see. A student wants to light up a bulb rated 6 volt 0.2 ampere using a car battery with negligible internal resistance. He connected the voltmeter across X and Y as in figure 1 to check the voltage since he wanted to connect the bulb across X and Y to obtain reduced voltage. Do you think this is a correct procedure? Explain. 
Now see, this is the car battery he is trying to use. So what he does, he, he wants only 6 voltage because the bulb is rated 6 voltage. So he can't directly connect the bulb to car battery, then you will get 12 voltage, the bulb will be burnt, the coil will be burnt. So what he does, he is trying to make a potential divider. What is this? The rheostat, you know the rheostat is like this, look at this, let me draw the rheostat. You will have, the coil will go like this. In the middle somewhere you will have a slider. So, what, what happens here, the 12 volt is connected between these two, right, see this is the plus side, so this is P, this is Q. And then from this middle, he takes another wire and with the minus side he takes it and he fixes the voltmeter here, uh, this is the point X, this is the point he says Y. So, what will happen here, look at this, entire 12 voltage will go across this, right, now that is his expectation and here you will have something less than 12 voltage because you are taking only part of the rheostat, right, okay. So, if, if voltmeter is assumed to be ideal, if it does not have any resistance, if it has infinity resistance, then where you will have 6 voltage, what you can expect is right at the middle, like if you take half of this rheostat, that will give you 6 voltage. If the full rheostat is 12 voltage, half of it has to give you 6 voltage. If voltmeter does not have a resistance, or voltmeter has a infinity resistance rather, in other words, voltmeter does not take any current through it, right, okay. So, now they are asking is this procedure correct? It will not be correct, I will tell you why. Now, now voltmeter that is also going to have a finite resistance, it will not have, it will not be ideal. So, what will happen in between these two points? the resistance is going to be resistance of this part of coil, this part of rheostat and the voltmeter. Let me draw it separately like this, look at this. So, how this circuit can be modified? See, I am drawing like this. Both are like rheostat's two parts and here you have the voltmeter. Wall meter is going to be another resistance, right? Across this only you take 6 voltage. Across this only you get 6, six voltage, that is what you are trying to do. So, what will happen, what will happen later when you remove this volt meter and when you bring in the bulb here, then it will not be 6 voltage there because bulb will not have the same resistance that volt meter had. Voltmeter will have a very high resistance, bulb will have a low resistance. So, the moment you take this voltmeter and plug in the bulb here, the resultant resistance of these two will rapidly go down. See, for example, let us say, let us say, okay, this is 100 ohms, this is 100 ohms, let us say it is altogether 200 ohm rheostat, right. Voltmeter, let us say it is ideal, it did not have, or it had very high infinity level of resistance, then 100, 100, 6 voltage, 6 voltage, you will have 12 voltage, 6 will drop here. The moment you put the bulb here, bulb might have a lower resistance, let us say 50 ohms. Now what will happen, this 100 and this 50 together, both are parallel because once the, once the bulb is fixed here, because that is what he is trying to do, he thinks, okay, when voltmeter shows 6 voltage, take the voltmeter out, plug the bulb because 6 voltage is there, he is wrong, he is wrong, the moment you pluck the bulb, this is what is going to happen, with, with the rheostat's resistance, this part of, this part of rheostat, the bulb becomes parallel like this, then the resultant resistance between these two is going to be 150, based on the values I have taken, 
hundred and fifty parallel. The answer will be hundred into fifty over hundred fifty. Hundred into fifty over hundred fifty. Three. You will have thirty three ohms. So the moment you put the bulb here with a fifty ohm resistance, this is going to be thirty three ohm. This is going to be hundred ohm. Now the twelve volt will not divide as six and six volt. Now this becomes thirty three ohms. Look at this. This is going to be thirty three ohms. You have hundred ohm here, so it's like one is to three. Then twelve voltage, nine voltage will drop here. Only three voltage will drop here because the resistance is one is to three, thirty three and hundred. So with three voltage here, the bulb will not light up because it needs six voltage. So he is doing a wrong procedure with this circuit, right? He is doing a wrong procedure with this circuit because the moment he does this, the moment he does this, okay, when voltmeter is there, voltmeter has a very high resistance. Therefore, that can be neglected. You can assume there is no current flowing through that. The moment you bring the bulb here, that is going to take a lot of current, and then then resultant resistance is what you will have to take, which will complicate the scenario. Right. So let's say, do you think this is a correct procedure? Right. I'll write the answer with this one. Ah, huh? this is this is all explanations for you. Right. For you to understand, the answer is this. No. Explain. We can say a uh, voltmeter is parallel to part of Rheostat. When voltmeter is replaced by the bulb, the resultant The resultant resistance will drop and thereby voltage will also drop. Voltage will also drop and thereby voltage will also drop. Right? Resistance will drop and thereby voltage will also drop. So, so this procedure will not be good enough. I'll explain again. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. I'll explain again what he is trying to do. He, in the first diagram, what he has done, he has taken a rheostat. Okay. Let me draw that long. And he has connected that across a battery. Twelve volt. So his his calculation is, if I can take from the middle here, right? If altogether it has twelve volt, the half of it should have six volt, right? So he fixes a volt meter here, move this here and there, and find when he gets six volt. The moment he gets six volt, he is going to take this volt meter out, fix the bulb in there, assuming there is six volt. Now, when volt meter is there, volt meter has very high resistance, so you can you can uh, like when when volt meter is parallel to this part, since it is very high resistance. The resultant resistance wouldn't change. Very high means this is like an open circuit, right? So this wouldn't impact the resistance of this part. But what will happen the moment you put the bulb there? Look at this. The moment you put the bulb there, the bulb is going to be like this, which will have a small resistance. That's what I said. Imagine if this is altogether two hundred ohms, this is infinity ohms. Then approximately in the middle, hundred ohm, hundred ohm, you will get the resistance. Now hundred ohm, hundred ohm points are here. This is hundred ohm. This is hundred ohm. You have taken the volt meter out. You have already set it at six volt. Now you brought the bulb. The moment you put bulb, bulb, let's say it has fifty ohm. Now look at this. In between these two points. The resistance is not as it was earlier. Earlier, hundred ohm. Here also, it will be hundred ohm because the voltmeter has very high resistance. Now the bulb doesn't have that much of resistance. 
If this is 100, if this is 50, the, the resultant between these two is going to be 33. So now it's going to be 133 in series. 12 voltage, how would it break among 133? You will have 9 voltage here, you will have 3 voltage here. Because 1 is to 3, 133 is 3 is 1. Voltage also will go in that ratio. Now the bulb gets only 3 voltage across it. It can't light up. It wouldn't operate. Right. Next. When rheostat sliding contact is moved from P to Q, the voltmeter reading change from 12 volt to 11.5 volt. Find the resistance of voltmeter if the maximum resistance of the rheostat is 1000 ohm. Look, what happens here? Let me draw that diagram again for you to understand better. 12 voltage. This point is P. Huh? This point is Q. Voltmeter. First it was connected here. So when it is connected here, anyway the 12 voltage has to be across this. There is no other resistance. That is why it shows 12 voltage. Then when it is moved to here, then when it is moved here, it shows only 11.5 voltage. Right? Look at this. When, when it is moved from P to Q, the reading changed from 12 voltage to 11.5 voltage. Uh, this must be in figure 2. Huh? Look at figure 2, not in figure 1. Figure 2. That is in figure 2. What he has done in figure 2? He has deleted this connection. Can you see? Right. So, let us see with that one. In figure 2, what he has done? In figure 2, this connection was not there. Right. This is how it goes on. Right. So, now what will happen? See, when, when he connects with point P, this is useless. So, voltage is directly across the battery. It shows 12 voltage. Now, when he brings it and connects it here, it is like this resistance and voltmeter are in series. Right. So, let me, let me show like this. Case 1, all these diagrams for you to understand, I am drawing this. Huh? Battery. I can ignore this resistance because that is not getting connected anywhere. When this is case 1, right? Then it is like in between P and Q. Q is anyway out of the circuit. Right? This, this is not there. Look. Okay. So, it is like current flows through this way and it goes through the voltmeter only. It is only the voltmeter you have. So, obviously, if this is 12 voltage, this would show 12 voltage. Right, assuming the internal resistance is negligence because E minus I R has to be the uh, reading. Here I also will be negligible because V has a high resistance. And I R, simple R is also negligible because they said negligible internal resistance. So, whatever the E, the voltmeter has to read. Later, when this is, when this is connected here, now what happens? 12 voltage battery and then this resistance and the voltmeter are in series and this has how much of resistance? Rheostat's maximum resistance is 1000 ohm. I do not know the resistance of this one Rv but it shows 11.5 voltage here. 12 voltage if this is 0.5 voltage because out of 12 if 11.5 is here how do I know that is 11.5? They say reading is 11.5. Reading is 11.5 means across that voltmeter, 11.5 voltage should have dropped. So, out of 12 voltage, 11.5 is here, balance 0.5 should be here. Then, since the same current flows through these two, look at this. I into 1000 is 0.5. I into RV voltmeter's resistance is 11.5. So, if you divide these two, you will get Rv over 1000, 11.5 over 0.5. From this Rv will be 23000 ohms. Obvious because the voltage drop is 23 times, 0.5 to 11.5, it is 23 times. If voltage drop in a series connection, if it is 23 times, resistance has to be 23 times. If this is 1000 ohms, this will be 23000 ohms. Right. So, what you have to write is only this part. 
I did all the rest of the drawings for you to understand. Huh? This is what you are right here. Uh, the, the resistance of the voltmeter RV is 23,000 ohms or 23 kilo ohms. The circuit can be rearranged as in figure 2 get 6 voltage by changing the rheostat. What is the current through voltmeter in this instance? Now look at this. What is in the circuit 2? That is what we saw. Now the rheostat just remains like this. From the middle of it, you get the voltmeter, middle or at some point, comes like this. Now they say this is 6 volt, 6 volt, correct? And, and, and the current is what they are asking. So we already found the resistance of this is 23,000 ohms. Therefore, the current has to be 6 volt divided by 23,000 ohms, V equals IR, right. So, if I, if I say, uh, let us say 60,000 into 10 to the power minus 4, that is going to be 2, 46, 14, 5, 150, no, 6 would be enough, 6, uh, 120, 138. So, that is 2.61 into 10 to the power minus 4, is not it? Minus 4 amperes. Right? Or you can say 0 0.261 milliamperes is the current that goes through the voltmeter. Then the student replaced the voltmeter with the bulb, but the bulb did not light up. Explain why. Come on. Now, this is 23,000 ohm. Right, so this this part of resistance and twenty three thousand are being in series. So after you change the rheostat, now this is going to be twenty three thousand ohms. This part of rheostat, this is going to be twenty three thousand ohm. That's how twelve volt has divided into six and six volt. The moment you replace this with bulb, bulb will not have twenty three thousand ohms. That's going to have like fifty or hundred ohms or two hundred ohms, something like that. So the moment you replace this with the bulb. The voltage, the, the, the resistance is going to be very low because of the voltage drop also will be low, bulb would not light up. So, let us say bulb will have very low resistance compared to compared to the voltmeter. when voltmeter is replaced by bulb, it will get much lower voltage than 6 voltage across it. That is why it would not light up. How can you change the circuit to light up the bulb? Thing is this, you cannot keep the voltmeter then bring in like remove the voltmeter bring in the bulb because that will that will completely change the setup because voltmeter has a high resistance, bulb has a low resistance, setting up everything, tuning everything, having the voltmeter and then take the voltmeter bring in the bulb into that will not work. You have to do the tuning having the bulb also in the circuit. So, what possibly you can do here, look at this, right, let us have the rheostat and then, right, have the bulb here and have the voltmeter here. This is the bulb. Then what will happen? Compared to the bulb's resistance and this rheostat, rheostat resistance, voltmeter's resistance is very high. When you put a resistance, very high resistance parallelly, the impact of that is negligible because when you take the resultant, you take 1 over R. So, 1 over very high re resistance make it almost 0. So, having this voltmeter here does not make much impact, right? Have the setup like this, move this 
slider and find when this shows 6 volt. When that shows 6 volt, bulb is getting 6 volt. It must light up. It must light up. So that's what you can do to get the bulb uh, lit up. Right. So that's a different question. This was from 92 special paper. So why I took this question here is uh, this is not directly from the meter bridge, but this is also about the potential dividing concept. Right. So in meter bridge also somewhat that's what we are trying to do on the meter bridge shrink. The, the balancing happens with that. So because of that, I thought this is somewhat connected to the concept that we study. This is from a special paper, 91, 92 special paper. This is 1996. A string with uniform cross section and length L has its terminals connected together to make a ring. We did this in 1982. We did that. 14 years later, 1996, it has repeated. The advantage of doing past papers is this. Not that you are going to memorize anything from the past papers and then you're, when, when you get it again, you are going to du duplicate the working. But certain ideas repeat. Anybody who did not do 1982 paper, when they went to this 1996 paper, this, this you know, ideology would be new. So they might take a little while to read and understand what's going around there. Somebody who has done a similar question in past paper quickly will connect it. Yes, I know what we did there. It, it won't be the same question. They will make some more changes here. But, but the ideology is going to be more or less same, right? So certain things you will not have to think freshly. You can take your learning from previous. That's what the learning is, right? It's not memorizing and going on going and repeating like a parrot. But, but you know, some learning from past papers would help you. Because most of the times, the questions and the ideas for the questions are not new. Because these exams are happening since like 1950s, 1960s. So you take the past papers and see, same ideas they repeat, you know, periodically. Right. So that's the importance of doing past papers. You ask all these high-ranking students who have done the exam in the previous batches. They would have done a lot of past papers. Right. You don't have to do... A lot of new things. Don't buy that book, this book and spend all your money and time into that. You focus on theory like with, with one teacher just study the theory and, and spend enough time doing the past papers. Right. If you are expert in past paper, if you are able to explain all the past paper questions, let's say last 40 years past papers, if you are able to explain, make sure like certain subjects, maths and all, uh, certain certain areas which were they are in syllabus have been removed. Right. So you need to understand, okay, what is in syllabus, what is not in syllabus, whatever that is not in syllabus has to be eliminated when you are practicing. Right. Maybe for that you can get the help of a senior student or a teacher to understand, okay, whether this is in syllabus or not. Within the syllabus constraints, within the syllabus limitations, if you practice all the past paper questions, right, what you get in today's exams won't be difficult at all. You can easily cross 90 percentage of marks and you know get a very good rank studying the theory carefully and doing the past papers. Come back. So what this is, it's made a ring. Only a part of the string is visible with the rest of it hidden within an electric insulator block as shown in the diagram. The total length L of the string and its resistivity are to be found. Okay. See, remember in 82 question, total length was given as 1 meter. Here the problem, part of the length is, you know, hidden here. So, total length is unknown. Total length is unknown. Careful. Total length L and the resistivity are to be found by measuring the resistance R between any two points of the ring in distance X. That thing is same. They are going to take any two points between those two points. That's distance is x meter, x meter, they are going to find the resistance between these two. That's what we did there as well. We used the meter bridge for that. State the method used in the laboratory to find R. Ohm meter or multimeter will not be accepted. If you say okay, we can use the ohm meter or, or multimeter to just, you know, find the resistance, that's not an acceptable answer. So, how do we find the resistance between these two points? Come on, that's what the meter bridge is used for to find an unknown resistance right so they are asking state a method used in the laboratory meter bridge method meter bridge method very simple to anybody who has done 82 paper 
82 to 96, 14 years is not so old at that time. Now, 82 might look very old to you uh, when you are in 2020s. But in 96, 82 is just 14 years back. Should have done. Anybody going to 96 advanced level should have done 82 past paper. It would have been a blunder if you did not do the past paper. Draw a clear circuit diagram of the experimental arrangement in A above. Very simple, very simple, very simple. This is the string. This is where you have that coil. And here you are going to have a known resistance R. Right. And here you will have a uh, galvanometer. Uh, we need to have that high resistance as well. Right. The high resistance will need a switch as well. You know the safety measures we give for the galvanometer, right? So, this is let us say R dash, R dash, R dash, right? If not, you know, if it is too congested, we can do like this. If it is getting too congested, let us extend the diagram, nothing wrong in that. Let us extend it like this. The string. Right. And here you will have a switch as well. Right. Write a formula for R in terms of resistance for unit length K, L and X. Right. Look at this. This is X. So, this has to be L minus X. So, this is like two points. Here you have one resistance. Here you have another resistance. This is x length per length it is k. Unit length resistance is k. So, it is going to be k x. This is going to be k into l minus x. Right. In between these two points means that these two are parallel. Right. So, they are asking r. Let us say 1 over r equals. You can do all these you know drawings on your rough paper. You do not have to show these drawings additional workings in the structured essay questions. So, you can do these in a rough paper and start writing like this k x k l minus x. From this if you solve r k x into l minus x over l. Ah, here l minus x will come x will go up. So, minus x plus x will cancel l would remain there. So, r will be equal to k x l minus x over l would be the right answer. Rearrange the variables in the formula above to get R over X on the left hand side. R over X on the left hand side. Right. So, just bring this X down. Yes. R over X equals what is going to remain there? Then K L over L. So, that will be K. That will be a constant. K X over L. So we'll, we'll write that first. Minus K over L into X plus L and L cancels, X goes down, K. So, you have Y equals MX plus C. MX plus C. What quantities will you choose for the axis to get a straight line graph using formula in D1 above? I already have marked it there. X axis, you will get X values. Y axis, y axis you will get r over x values r over x next how will you find the values of k and l from the above graph k is straightforward i think look at this yes intercept will give you k and using the intercept and gradient you can find look at this we will say intercept is going to be k. Gradient is going to be minus k over l. So, if you divide these two, 
L will be uh, take minus gradient and divide by intercept. No, other way around. Intercept divided by minus gradient. Minus, I have put it common here. So, that minus will anyway cancel this minus. Then when you divide k by this one, k and k will get cancelled, capital L will go up. k and k will get cancelled, capital L will go up. What additional measurement will be required to find the resistivity of the strings material after finding the value of k? What additional measurement will be required to find the resistivity of the strings material? You remember, after finding resistance, then with this formula, you can find k and L. Once you have found k, k is going to be rho L over A, L is 1 meter. Why? You are talking about per length, unit length resistance is what you have taken as k, which means L is 1. To find rho, what else do you need? A. So, you write the answer, I need the cross section of the wire or string, no marks for you, no marks. Why no marks for that? You can't measure the cross section, they are asking what measurement will be required. Cross section is not a measurement. What do we measure there? Is it the radius that we measure there? No, we don't measure the radius also. What do we measure there? Actually, what we measure for a wire or, or string is just the diameter. Diameter, you have to say diameter. It's not radius, it's, it's not cross section. It's not the cross section area. It's the diameter we measure and then we calculate cross section area. Even that you wouldn't have make, made, made a mistake. If you did 1982 paper, because there they gave the diameter and we had to calculate the area. So that, that you will remember, okay, what did they give there? Diameter. Half of the students have written for this cross-sectional area is required. No marks because they ask what's the measurement. You cannot measure the cross-sectional area. You can measure only the diameter. So we can say what other measurement will be required. Diameter of the string or wire. A student got a straight line parallel to x axis when drawing the graph in D2 in a similar experiment. State the reason for this. Aha, uh -huh, he has got straight line graph which is parallel to x axis. That means, look at this, when he draws the graph, r over x is what we took, took in the y axis, x here, he got a constant value. Let it be C, I don't know what value it is, constant value. He doesn't have a gradient. He doesn't have a gradient means if we, if we go back to the graph, this is the graph we had R over X equals minus K over L plus K, K over L into X plus K. So, this has zero gradient. Gradient is zero means this has to be zero. But intercept is not zero, K is not zero, K is there, K is there, K is there, still the gradient is zero means k over l has to be 0. How can k over l be 0? Like mathematically thinking, if k is not 0, k over l has to be 0, l must be infinity. If l is infinity only, k over l, l will become 0. Now think how l can become infinity. If l is infinity means either the length of the wire is so long because you don't know how they have given the length is like this. This is in the block. So, the part which is within the block must be very long, like hundreds of meters, that makes the uh, uh, graph like this. The k over l becomes almost 0. If l is very high, k over l will be almost 0. You will get a very small slope, the graph which you may not be able to observe. If not, if not, maybe, maybe somewhere. The, the wire, the string would have broken. Then the L is not complete, right? So, then if L is not complete, it's like L is infinity. Open circuit. Because you take this as X and this as L minus X. But that's not L minus X, it's infinity here. It's not connected. Understand? So, those are the possibilities. Because simply like think mathematically, gradient is 0. They are talking about gradient 0 graph. Gradient is K over L. How can that be 0 if k is not 0? How do we know k is not 0? Because they say it is a graph parallel to x axis. That means it has some value. 
intercept is there, which means k is there, but k over l is not there, which means l has to be infinity. Let's say, say the reason for this, the string or wire would have been broken within the block. Don't ask me, can't it be broken outside the block? Come on, if it is broken outside, you can see that, right? You don't have to find it through the experiment, it's broken. If it is broken within the block only, which we don't know, it's hidden. right? So, maybe it's broken. Or you can say the L is very high, that makes it almost zero. So, that part is a little bit of, you know, work to the brain. You have to think and answer. Before that, all of that was almost, you know, if you have done 1982 paper, and if you know the meter bridge, would have been very simply answerable. This is 2001 paper. 2001, we did 82, then 96, 2001. The diagram shows a bridge circuit. R1, R3 and R4 are resistances and R2 is a variable resistance. R1, R3, R4 are resistances. R2 is a variable resistance. G is a center zero galvanometer. Right. What change can you observe in the deflection of the galvanometer when R2's value is increased from 0 to a high value? R2's value is increased from 0 to high value. Now look at this. When R2's value is 0, A and D will have same voltage. Right? See, I'll, I'll, I'll change this. If I match this with our meter bridge, right, R3 and R4 are fixed. Right, A, C, this point is B, A to B you have R. B to C, you have R3. Those are fixed values. Correct? Now, you have R2 and R4. Hmm. R2, R4. But in meter bridge, what happens? Uh, uh, when you change R2, R4 also changes, isn't it? Here, R4 is also fixed. R4 is also fixed. R4 is also fixed. So, so, let me put it like this. Not exactly a meter bridge, but some bridge circuit. I can't draw the meter bridge exactly here because in meter bridge, when R2 is changed, R4 also will change because R2 and R4 together, it's just that shrink. Right. So, this is what they have. Now, they are asking when you change this from 0 to very high value, what can you expect on the deflection of uh, uh, galvanometer? Now, let me put some values for you and show you. Okay, let us say this is a 4 voltage resistance, 4 voltage battery. Then, let me take this point as 0, 0, 0. Let us assume these two are equal for now, simply. Let us assume, huh? assume, just you know, understand, we will assume like that. So, 4 voltage, 4 voltage, 4 voltage, if this is equal to voltage. Imagine when this is 0, right, if this does not have any resistance, 4 voltage, 2 voltage, current flow has to be up. Galvanometer will show a certain direction. Then, when this resistance is increased, when these two become equal, this is going to have a fixed value, right? So, when this resistance keeps increasing, at some point, they will have equal, equal resistance. Then what will happen if it is equal resistance, at that point, this will become 2 voltage. So, your galvanometer, let us say earlier it has shown this reading. Now, when, when, the, when the resistance R2 is increased, little by little, this will come to this point. When these two become equal, R2 and R4 become equal, since R and R3 are equal, huh? I assumed R and R3 are equal. So, at some value, they will come to this point. After that also, if you keep increasing R2, 
Now this won't remain at two voltage. This will be because more voltage will fall here. Because the proportion of like when you compare these two resistances, proportion of this one increases means it gets more voltage here. So if this is four, then what will happen? Uh, the, the voltage drop here has to be more than two voltages. So this might come down. This might come to one voltage likewise. This is going to be a two itself. Now the current flow is going to be downwards. That means it will show deflection on the other side. So when R2 is increased from zero to very high value, what can you see in the galvanometer? Galvanometer's deflection will change from one side to the opposite side. Right, through zero it will go to the other side. Let's write that. Galvanometer's galvanometer deflection will or will change from one side to the other. When the bridge balances for a particular value of R2, the currents through R1 and R2 were I1 and I2 respectively. What are the currents through R3 and R4? R1 and R2, I1, R1, I1, R2, I2. So if this is I1, this also has to be I1 because here the current is 0. Balancing point means that current has to be 0. So if I, I1 current goes through R1, R3 also will have I1 current. I2 current goes through R2, same I2 current will go to R4 also because there won't be any current leakage. Galvanometer shows zero reading. So R3, I1, R4, I2, no change in that. What is the voltage difference between B and D? B and D. B and D voltage difference will be zero. There will be equipotential points, equipotential points, zero, zero. Write down the relationship between the following, VAB and VAD. Now look at this, VAB and VAD. Let's check that, VAB and VAD. A, now B and D are equipotential, that means A to B potential, A to D potential, it has to be the same, right? Because B and D are equipotential points. So VAB and BD, VBD must be equal. Similarly, CB and CD also must be equal. I think that's the next one they ask. VAB, VAD are equal. Yes, VBC and VDC are also equal. Double check. VBC, see BC and DC must also be equal. Write down the formula for VAB, VBC, VAD and VDC in terms of R1, R2, R3, R4, I1, I2. VAB means I1 current goes through R1, correct? Go and see. I1, R1. AD means I2, R2. I2, R2. VBC means I1 R3, VCD or VDC, however you write. Better to write DC because from D to C only the voltage drops, I2 R4. Obtain an expression for R4 in terms of R1, R2, R3. Not very difficult, look at these two, Let, let's number them. They want the answer without I. Let's remove I's. 1 and 3, if you divide, I1, I1 cancels. Or you can even use this concept. VAB, VAD. ABAD. We'll, we'll first divide these two. VAB over VBC. VAB over VBC. Right, or we'll write this. Look at this. We have already written. We have already written VAB 
and VAC are equal, AD are equal, VAB and AD. See, AB and AD are equal. VAB, AD means I1, R1, I2, R2 are equal. I1, R1, I2, R2. Let it be equation 5. Similarly, we have proven VBC and VDC are equal. VBC is I1, R3. DC is I2, R4. I1, R3, I2, R4. 6. Now, if you divide 5 and 6, I1, I1 cancels, you get R1 over R3. I2, I2 cancels, you get R2 over R4. And what do they want you to make the subject? R4. R4 equals huh? R2, R3 over R1. R2, R3 over R1. Right? Next. Find the value of R4 if R1 is this, R3 is this, R2 is this. Simple, simple, simple. R4 has to be R2, R3 up, R1 down. R2, R3. R2 is 82. R3 is 50, R1 is 100. 50, 102, you get 41 ohms. 41 ohms, very simple. A student wants to use the above circuit to find very small resistance. He is given, that's less than 1 ohm, he is given the following. 3 resistances, 10 ohm, 100 ohm and 1000 ohm. 2 resistance boxes, 0 to 100 and 0 to 1000 ohms. He is using the unknown resistance R instead of R4. Instead of R4. What resistances or resistance box should he choose for R1, R2, R3 from the above in order to obtain the value of R more accurately? Right. Now, you know, R4 over, if I rearrange this, R4 over R3 must be equal to R2 over R1. Right? See, this is going to be something less than 1 ohm. R4 is going to be less than 1 ohm. R1 and R3 are fixed ones. R2 is variable. Now, if this less than 1 ohm, we don't have anything less than 1 here. So, R3 ideally if we can R take R4 and R3 equal, good. But we don't have anything less than 1 ohm. So, what we will do, we will bring 10 ohm for this. Suppose if this is 1 ohm, you have 10 times of it here. If it is 0.5 ohm, you have 20 times of it here. If that is like 10, 20 times, R2 to R1 ratio also must be something like that. So, how can we set R2 to R1? Look at this. R2 is a variable resistance, right? We can take R2 and R1. R2, let's take 0 to 100. R2, let's take 0 to 100. If you take 0 to 100, then R1, we can select 100 ohms. So, imagine what ideally you can do here, 100 or even 1000 ohms would be better, 1000. Let us say, suppose if this is 0.5 ohm, what would happen here, 0 0.5? If this is 0 0.5, 0 0.5 over 10 you have. 10,000 means it is 100 times. 100 times means 0 0.5 into 100 times is going to be 50. Correct? You all you have 0 to 100 resistance there. 50 ohm would be somewhere in the middle. Comfortably, you can make it 50 and balance it. Suppose if this is 0 0.25, what will happen? 0 0.25. This is fixed at 10. This is 1000 fixed. So, this is 100 times. You have to get 25 ohms here. 0 to 100, you can comfortably make 25 ohms. Suppose if this is 0.1 ohm, what happens? 0.1 over 10. Here 1000 is fixed. 100 times. 100 times of that is 10 ohm. 
0 to 100, you can comfortably make 10 ohms. So, the ideal collection here would be, ideal answer would be, look at this, we will say, R1 must be 1000 ohm, R2 must be 0 to 100 ohm variable, right, resistant box. Okay, that's how we had it in the circuit also, R2 was variable, yes. R3 you can take 10 ohms, clear, R3 can be taken 10 ohms, that would give you comfortable answers. When bridge is balanced, if the galvanometer and battery are interchanged, what should be the deflection of galvanometer? Now look at this. Now, where is this diagram that I have drawn? R, R1, R3, R2, R4, R1, R3, R2, R4. Now, these two points are equipotential, the galvanometer is here, right, it shows 0. This is where the battery is. When this shows 0 reading, we already have seen R1 to R2, R1 to R3, the ratio between these two and R2 to R4 must be equal. Then only, you know, equipotential, these two will become equipotential. Now, what they say, they want to put the battery in the middle. Then you will have R1 here, R2 here. These are like nice questions to be tested in MCQs also, giving you the statements, true, false. So, understand and study. They want to put the galvanometer here, right, R1, R3, R2, R4. They are asking what would be the reading of galvanometer. Now, look at this. If you take this side, R1 to R2 ratio and this side R3 to R4 ratio, what can we see? If you rearrange, R2 comes down, uh, look at this, R3 goes up, R2 comes down, so R1 over R2, R3 over R4 will be equal. R1 to R2 and R3 to R4 equal means, imagine, look at this, R1 to R2 means, the voltage ratio between these two. Suppose let's say this is 1 is to 2 and this is 3 ohm, so 3 voltage. So, 1 voltage will drop here, 2 voltage will drop here. If this is 1 is to 2, this is also 1 is to 2 because R1 to R2, R3, R4 same. So, again 1 voltage, 2 voltage will drop, which means these two points will become equipotential again. Ah, uh, Look at this, look at this. Let's say this is 12 voltage. Let's say this is 1 is to 2. If I take this point as 0, what would be the voltage here? 1 is to 2, right? 1 is to 2 means you will have 8 voltage here, 4 voltage here, 0. So, this point will be 8 voltage. If this is 1 is to 2, this also has to be 1 is to 2. Why? From this we have got, right? Then again, this also has to be 8 voltage. 8 voltage, 8 voltage connected galvanometer would not show any reading. So, at equilibrium in the meter bridge or even this bridge diagrams, if galvanometer and, and battery are interchanged, still galvanometer would show zero reading, right? What should be the deflection of galvanometer? Zero, zero, nothing else, huh? nothing else. So, that is again another nice question. The last part, they, they had something for you to think. But mind you, this was already tested in MCQ in the past paper. Anybody who has done few past papers would remember this point, which, is, which was already like tested and discussed in the classes, would have known. That's why past paper is more important. Don't waste your time in you know, doing the model paper, that and this. Focus on past papers. 
analyze the past papers, understand and study. That gives you a clear guidance as to how to answer the future questions. Now, another question 2002. Right, so 2002, they have given a diagram where a simple circuit is there. And diagram 2 shows the dial of a milliampere. Milliampere. Let's check that. A resistance S, a milliampere A, A, and a battery E are connected in series across X and Y as shown in the diagram 1. Right. S is a resistance. A is the milliampere, E is the battery, and uh, uh, that's all, right. Internal resistance of the milliampere is 25 ohm, and it requires 1 milliampere current for the full-scale deflection. The dial of milliampere is shown in figure 2. Battery's EMF is 10 volt, and its internal resistance is negligible, right. R is a resistance connected across X and Y. Okay, that's an external resistance, right. I is the current through milliampere. Okay, circuit looks very simple. Let's see what, what they want to know. Milliampere shows a full scale deflection when R equals 0. Find the value of resistance S. This is 25 ohm. That has an internal resistance of 25 ohm. E how much? E is 10 voltage. 10 voltage, E is 10 voltage. When R is 0, full scale deflection. That means when R is 0, it has to be 1 milliampere. When R is 0, I is 1 milliampere. So, let us say I has to be E divided by S plus 25. R so, S plus 25, S, S must be equal to E over I minus 25. E is 10 voltage. I is 1 milliampere. Careful. Minus 25. So, this goes as 10,000 up. 10,000 minus 25, 9,975 ohms. So, value of S is 9,975 ohms. Done. Next. Second part of it. How will you obtain R equals 0 in the experiment? Write down the value of R in the respective box of the deflection of ammeters index. Let me write this first. R is 0 when, when R is 0, I is 1 milliampere, right? So, let us show it here. R is 0. This is where R is 0. I just have write 0. R is 0. 1 milliampere, correct? How do we get R equals 0? Simply short circuit. Short circuit means look at the circuit. You connect X and Y directly. Short circuit X and Y. Without R, just connect X and Y directly. That, that will give you R is 0. Right? So, let us say short circuit or connect X and Y directly without anything in between. What is the current through milliampere when R equals infinity? When R is infinity, well, the circuit will not be complete. R is infinity means it's like broken circuit, the open circuit here. What would be the I then? I will be zero. When R is infinity, I will be zero. I will be zero. I will be zero. Right. Show this. So, I is 0 means R is infinity. We already marked 0 here. When R is 0, this is I. This is infinity. This is 0. When R is 0 and R is infinity. Next. How will you obtain R equals infinity in the experiment? Keep X and Y open. Keep X and Y open. That means do not connect anything in between X and Y. Do not have a connection between X and Y. Right? Keep X and Y disconnected. Disconnected. That is what you call keeping it open. Keeping it open. For what values of R will the milliampere show the following readings? Half of the full scale deflection. To show half of the full scale deflection means 
0.5 milli ampere look at this look at this we saw when it is 10,000 altogether it shows 1 milli ampere so if it has to come down to half of that current the resistance has to double resistance has to double means already s and a together it's 10,000 then if r becomes another 10,000 resistance will double current will become half so to have half of the full scale deflection r has to be 10,000 because s and m meter together they have a 10,000 when r is not there that 10,000 resistance draws a current of 1 milliampere you want to make it half a milliampere that means the resistance has to double already 10,000 is there bring in another 10,000 to double it quarter of the full scale if you want to quarter it, that means 1 milliampere has to become 1 by 4 milliampere. Resistance has to become 4 times. Already 10,000 is there. Now it has to become 40,000. That means what I have to bring in new is 30,000. R has to be 30,000. R has to be 30,000. Then with the existing 10,000, it will become 40,000 altogether. Write the above values of R also in the relevant boxes. Wait. Here we already marked infinity. Here we mark 0. In this middle point, it has to be 10,000 ohms. So, let us say 10k ohm. I am writing outside the box as the box is too small. Here, it has to be 30k. Hmm. So, when let us see, you have some circuit, right, which has like this S and you know M meter and all. Now, here you can come and connect any resistance. This is XY. When resistance here is 0, ammeter will show you. Now, now look at this. We can, we can do this. This part, we can hide it. Just hide it. So, what you are going to see? Only these two terminals and the reading at ammeter. Right? So, in the terminal, what you connect and what reading you get here. If you do not connect anything, if you short circuit it, if, if, if the resistance is 0 here, ammeter will show you 1 milliampere full scale if this is open circuit ammeter will show you zero current that means infinity resistance zero current if you connect 10 kilo ohms here ammeter will show you the middle line half of the full scale deflection if you connect 30 kilo ohm here it will show 0.25 ampere likewise I can come up with the relationship between what resistance I am connecting here and what the the meter shows so basically i'm trying to scale this like a ohm meter which can give us a resistance measurement of resistance i show i whatever the resistance i plug in here accordingly the meter shows a deflection so i'm trying to put the scale for that scale for that right if the part of the circuit with milliampere in figure 1 that is the part of circuit in the right side x and y has been scaled to other values also in the milliampere table. This arrangement can be used to find unknown resistances. Right? That's what I told you. It can it can work like an ohm meter. You go and plug different different resistances. It shows the deflection accordingly. So so that if I can make this table already, like for each of these readings, what resistance has to be plugged in. If I can make this reading, the table, then based on the ammeter's reading, I know what, resi what resistance has been plugged in. Suppose ammeter shows half of the reading, I know 10,000 ohm have been plugged in here. Right. So, what do they ask based on that? The value of unknown resistance can be read from scale when the unknown resistance is connected between x and y. Yes. So, what is the requirement now? Suggest a standard name for this arrangement, ohm meter. It, it gives you an indication, it gives you a reading of uh, uh, re the resistance, which you call ohm meter. Ohm meter. Next. Is the scale of milliampere uniform or not? Is the scale of measuring the resistance uniform or not? So, milliampere is uniform. uniform or you can say linear 
right? See, it, it, it starts from point like each, each scale is equal, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.1, it's equal, right? It, it goes uniformly, it goes evenly. But look at the resistance. For half of this deflection, it went from 0 to 10k. For the next half, it, it has come from 10 to infinity. It can't be, it can't be uniform. Look at this. Within this quarter, it has gone from 10 to 30. It has gone by 20 kilo ohms. In the first half, it has gone only by 10 kilo ohms. But in the next quarter, it has gone by 20 kilo ohms. And then in the last quarter, it has gone up very high from 30 kilo ohm to infinity. So you don't see a uniform relationship. It doesn't go by equal amounts. Right. So, so the resistance measurement is not uniform. Milliampere readings uniform. The resistance not uniform. Not uniform or not linear. Not uniform or not linear. Draw a rough sketch to show the variation of current with resistance R. Now you know uh, uh, the voltage E equals I into R plus 10,000. So look at this. Uh, we have R in the y axis, right? R is going to be E into 1 over I, E into 1 over I minus 10,000. That's why it's going to be R equals E into 1 over I minus 10,000. So, when I is 0, R has to be infinity, right? When R is 0, I has some value. So, this is how the graph will be. Check that. That's how the graph will be. When R is 0, I had a value. How much was I? I was 1 milliampere. This was 1 milliampere. This was 1 milliampere. Right? I was 0 when R was infinity, which I can't mark here. That's why I did not cut the y axis. And it's a curve because R and 1 over y are related. R and 1 over y are related. So it's a curve. It's a curve. Not a straight line. It's a curve. Right, so that's all from the 2001 paper. Bit of a different question that is, but not that difficult with the, like they have tested the fundamentals. Basics is what they have tested here. Now let's see another paper, 2013 one. In the, in the circuit shown in figure 1, R1, R2, R3 and R4 represent resistances and E represents the EMF of the cell. Right. R1, R2, R3, R4 are resistances. E represents the EMF of the cell. If the potential at B is same as that at D, potential at B is same as at D, derive an expression relating to R1, R2, R3, R4. Derive, they say derive, derive, derive. So, let me say this way. VAB and VAD are equal. Similarly, like VBC and VDC are equal. Why? B and D are equipotential. So, AB, AD. I1, R1, AB is I1, R1. AD means I2, R3. Here, BC, I1, R2. DC means I2, R4. Let it be 1. Let it be 2. 1 divided by 2, R1, R1, or I1, I1 cancels, you get R1 over R2. I2, I2 cancels, you get R3 over R4. So, R1 to R2 ratio, R3 to R4 ratio must be equal. Right? So we have done this several times. Even in the previous past paper, it was tested. Only thing is, they say derive it. So, you have to carefully do it. The above circuit can be used to measure the value of an unknown resistor, say R2, by replacing resistor corresponding to R3 and R4 with a uniform resistive wire as shown in figure 2. Right, this one, yeah. So that brings our meter bridge. That brings our meter bridge. 
All resistors and the resistive wire are connected using wide copper strips. The length of the resistive wire is exactly 1 meter. What is the main reason for using wide copper strips instead of connecting wires when connecting the components? Why do we use wide copper strips here? To reduce the resistance, right? to make the resistance of these strips negligible because since the cross section increases, their resistance will drop, right? To minimize the resistances, resistance of connecting strips. Connecting strips. Identify the item X in the circuit precisely. Where is X? Where is X? This is X. You know what it is. Galvanometer. Let's say center zero galvanometer. You have to particularly say center zero. Not just galvanometer. It is center zero galvanometer. Center zero galvanometer. If the unknown value of R2 is to be determined by plotting a graph, state whether you would use a resistance box or rheostat for R1. Give reasons for your answer. Right. Look at this. So, here what you are going to see, R1 over R2 is L over 100 minus L. L over 100 minus L. Right. So, how are you going to draw the graph? If I make it upside down, R2 over R1, 100 over L, minus 1, right. So, what we can, now this is what you have to find. So, R1 you have to change. So, let us say 1 over L equals, if I rearrange it, 1 over L is equal, L equals R2 by 100 into 1 over R1 plus 1 over 100. Y M X C. If it is in uh, centimeters, it is going to be 100 minus L and all. If you are writing the L in meter, it will be 1 minus L. So, 100 won't be there. Anyway, what matters to us here, 1 over R1 is what you are taking the x axis. That means you need to know the R1 values. If you use the rheostat here, you can change the resistance and find different different values for L, but you would not know the value of the resistance that you have used. Therefore, it has to be a resistance box, then only you will know R1 values. So, they are asking will you use a resistance box or rheostat? It has to be a resistant box. The values of R1 will be needed or will be required to draw the graph, to draw the graph to draw the graph. Right? Uh, Ryostat does not give or does not indicate or does not give the value of resistance, value of resistance being used, being used. Next, write down an expression relating R1, R2 and balance length L. Just now I wrote it, R1 over R2 equals L over 100 minus L. And do they ask us to rearrange it? Rearrange the variables in expression given under E1 so that it is suitable to plot graph with the reciprocal 1 over R1 of the independent variable R1 as x axis. Okay. So, rearrange it, rearrange it. R2 over R1 equals 100 minus L over L. Let us note it here L is in centimeters. Right. So, you will have uh, R2 over R1 that 100 R1 100 over L minus 1. 1 over L equals R2 over 100 
1 over R1, 1 over 100. Y, M, X, C. If somebody has written L in meters, this 100 would have been 1. Then the formula you would have got is 1 over L equals R2 into 1 over R1 plus 1. The 100 would not be there. Instead of 100, you will have 1. How do you find R2 from the graph? Gradient will be R2 over 100. Gradient will be R2 over 100. Isn't it? So, from that you can find R2. You can say R2 is going to be 100 times gradient. You have to be careful. L has to be measured and drawn the graph in centimeters itself. Otherwise, the 100 would not come. Next. Give two reasons for not selecting R1 values which produce small values of L. Why, why we should not choose small values for L? First one, to reduce the fractional error in measuring L. Second one, Second one, to reduce the impact of end correction, end correction. Let me explain what that. See, end correction means, now first understand what is this fractional error in uh, taking the measurement. If you take a meter ruler, smallest measurement you can take there is 1 millimeter. So, the error you can have is 1 millimeter, right. So, if, if error you can have is 1 millimeter, fractional error is going to be or the error you can have is 0.5 millimeter, right. If the error you can have is 0.5 millimeter, fractional error is 0.5 divided by the measurement you take. So, if you take 5 centimeter measurement, 0.5 over 5, which is 10 percentage. If you take 50 centimeter measurement, 0.5 over 50, which is only 1 percentage. So, when using any measuring instrument, there can be a fractional error, which is the possible error, maximum possible error in that instrument divided by uh, the measurement. You know the meaning of uh, error in measurement. When 1 millimeter lines are there, you might get 0.5 millimeter reading error. Because let us say, let us say this is 11 millimeter, this is 12 millimeter. In between, suppose if this is where the reading line that you have to take, you are going to take it as either 11 or 12, right? Because there is no in between readings for you. So, imagine if this is at 11.5 and if you take it as 12, the error you take is 0.5. So, that is inbuilt to any, any instrument, any, any measuring instrument will have a measuring error in that. So, that, that fraction, how, how we show that is the error divided by the reading we take. So, if the reading becomes smaller and smaller, fractional error is going to increase. That is the first point I said. If L is small, fractional error in reading is high. Second one I said, see, end correction means the string goes like this and here it is attached to a, a nail or, or some part where it is connected. So, when you are taking the measurement, your meter ruler, meter ruler 0 might be here. Sometimes the 0 where it has to start because since it is you know rolled up like it is connected to a nail there, there might be a little bit of confusion where the 0 has to be exactly. Sometimes the actual 0 of the string where the length starts may not be at the 0 that the meter ruler indicates. The 0 indicated by the meter ruler, where the actual 0 starts for the string can have a gap in between, which is what we call end correction, end correction, which is a different thing from measurement error. End correction is different, measurement error is different, right. So, this end correction, uh, what will happen? So, that also will have an impact, right, the fractional error. Suppose, let us say this end correction is 0.2 millimeters. So, impact of that when I measure 50 centimeter, impact of that 0.2 millimeter is negligible. But when I measure 2 centimeter, that 0.2 millimeter is an important, uh, the impact is big, right? The percentage is big. So, that is the second point I said to reduce the impact of 
end correction end correction clear which i we did not discuss earlier since they asked for two reasons i am giving you both reasons clear so that's the last part of this question in 2013 so every every question you understand last part they have something for you to think and answer right so that one part anyway you have to think and answer you won't be able to see that in previous past papers anywhere but you know with some common sense you will be able to answer right so i have done several past several many past paper questions on this particular experiment practice all of them right would be easy for you to face any question that you get in your exam right now practice this very well in the next session we will meet up with another experiment in physics